Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 222 of At Odds with Wrestling. Joe and Adam here. Adam, hello. How are you? I'm doing good, Joe. Other than you being sick again, how was your Christmas? Again, I'm sick. Again, this is uh, Jonas, uh, formerly of Pod Van Dam. Not that he left the show, but the show doesn't exist anymore. Uh, his prophecy coming true that I'm sick all the time. Nonstop. <laughs> Nonstop. No, my kid got sick on Saturday, um, Christmas Day. Like, we woke up, we did presents, the whole thing. And then uh, it was breakfast time, and he was just, like, conked out on the floor. I'm like, hey, buddy, what's going on? And he's like, I don't feel good. Mm-hmm. And we took his temperature, and it was, like, 103. We're like, oh, well, he's he's sick, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's not like we had anything doing saturday and we didn't have anything doing sunday and our monday plans we canceled because he was still running a little bit of a fever but he felt fine by sunday but it was just that first day when he had the really high-end fever and then uh as we were recording tuesday for long box heroes i could feel it hitting me you know mm-hmm. so i've just been you know pilled up the whole time but still i'm like all schnotty and stuff you know yeah i've been- uh, not not LVAC related. I didn't catch it there. I can assure you. I've double checked with the majority of the people there, and uh, no one else is sick. Yeah, whoever that patient zero was must not have came that time. You know, right? But exactly. We, we, we both masked up, so. Yeah, I, you know. Well, we'll get into LVAC when we get into LVAC later. But anything else going on with you? How was your Christmas? Ah, uh, it was fine. Um, I, I, I have a funny story to say real quick. Um, I've mentioned before on the pod that. Uh, my uh, one of my best friends has a kid that like collects wrestling figures, and it was a little uh, start and stop as far as whether he still wanted them for Christmas. But I got the go ahead, maybe like a week or two before that he wanted some figs, so I bought him uh, like a Danielson figure he asked for, an FTR he asked for. Like he's really into AEW now, and like he kind of do- doesn't want to touch his old WWE figures. Um, but like I put together a box of figures for him. And I was just, like, kind of filling it up with stuff. And I threw in a Rey Mysterio basic that I won on Whatnot, like, six months ago. Okay. And when he's opening up, he opens that one. And he's you can kind of tell that he's, like, feigning that he's, like, happy about it. You know, because not only does he not care about WWE anymore, he knows enough that a basic sucks. Right? So I was like, it's okay, bud. You can job him out. (laughs) Like, I'm explaining to him. And I decided that I got his dad's, like, reluctant permission that uh, come the summertime, we're going to have an Inferno match with Rey Mysterio. (laughs) Oh, get out of town. I told him about the broski thing with where I didn't say exactly how to do it, but I remembered, you know, cover the figure in hairspray (laughs) and then turn away (laughs) and then light the figure on fire. So uh, poor Ray is going to be uh, run out of the territory with an Inferno match. <laughs> and you're going to like wear the black gloves and everything else like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah black gloves, black sleeves, you know, <laughs> we're going to take this big fed seriously. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> Instilling Broski's bad habits on the generations of Tamar, huh? That's what I got to do. Yeah. Did Did you listen to this week's uh, Broski show? I think, so. yeah, a couple days ago. Yeah, I listened to it. I was hoping you were going to say you were a few weeks behind so I could accuse you of not listening anymore. <laughs> no, I listened to that. I lis- uh, I think I'm relatively caught up. I listened to Pod Van Dam earlier today, and I just finished previewing the past from, like, weeks ago. So yes. I'm relatively See, caught there up. See, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, I don't listen anymore. Uh, but, no, that broski travel story was, like, the ultimate broski. I, I don't want to spend another second with my parents. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. Like, I, I'd rather drive 24 hours than spend an extra day in New York along. Well, you made it with 17, you know, yeah, that's yeah. Lots of coffee, Red Bulls, beef jerky. <laughs> and it was one of those things as he's telling this story. It's not until he's like three fourths of the way into the story that I'm like, oh, my God, Chelsea was probably with him during all of this. Oh, poor Chelsea. Poor Chelsea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I'm what glad I-, I was just going to say I'm glad Christmas is over. Um, I can like finally go back to going to stores, going on doll safari. You know, I don't have to deal with like the craziness of people. So I it was beautiful to to- on my way home from the comic shop on Wednesday. Like that, the area by me where the arena is and the Walmart and everything else. It's always so it's been congested like that for like the last like five six weeks. 
And today, you know, come or, or Wednesday, coming home, get off the exit, make a left, and there was like a ghost town. There was nobody out. It was great. Yeah. Although I did cause another scene at like a store this week, so it's it's business as usual for me. I, I have that in my notes. Let's talk about that in weekly purchases, even though you didn't purchase anything. Uh, out, well, maybe you did out, out on Dull Safari. That's what weekly purchases is for, right? Yeah, fair enough. All right. Let's, All right, let's, the show. let's start the show off. And now, At Odds with Wrestling presents This Day in Wrestling History. So, on this day in wrestling history, uh, 1991, kissing right up against that time frame where Adam uh, first discovered wrestling. Mm, where it's where wrestling started. Come on, we'll get into that later. I've got a, I, I've got gripes, <laughs> but spoiler. World Championship Wrestling held uh, their Starcade Battle Bowl event. Um, this was at the time where Dusty Rhodes was back as Booker after leaving. World Wrestling Entertainment after he was already in WCW and WA, and he was trying to make Battle Bowl a thing. And the person who wins the Battle Bowl ring, you know, and this is kind of where the Dynamite Diamond ring comes from in AEW today, right? Okay. So what this was, it was a, a, a selection of the roster, and they did a shoot random draw, okay? A, a shoot shoot, like real? Okay. 91, 92, 93, they do shoot random draws. 94, okay. there is no Battle Bowl. 95, it's the workiest of worked Battle Bowls of all time. Yeah, like guys like teaming with their rivals or happening to be across from people that they're you know used to wrestling. I got gotcha. you. There's three instances where tag teams get picked together. There's four instances where rivals are on the same team with each other. And then there's one instance where it's like a rival and a rival against a rival and another rival. <laughs> okay. But these the, the early ones were legit shoot um, picks. And this this card overall – and so what it is, it says it's a bunch of these tag team matches. And then the winners of the tag team matches go on to a two-ring battle royal, which is always a blast – and then the winner of the two ring battle royal gets the battle bowl ring, which inevitably is supposed to make you the number one contender, right? Okay. Um, but this is like if you look at some of the pairings here, like you could tell that it's a shoot where Diamond Dallas Page and Mike Graham uh, take on Bill Kazmaier and Jushin Liger, and I only point that <laughs> match out because that's really the only match that you well that. And uh, Sting, Abdul the Butcher, who were feuding at the time, taking on Brian Pillman and Bobby Eaton, was good because Sting and Abdul were feuding at the time, but Sting wins the Battle Roy Sting wins Battle Bowl, so they had to figure out a way to book on the fly of like how these guys that are feuding with each other are going to win the match, right? So they get yeah. a little creative there. But the Bill Kazmaier Liger, which you couldn't be two more diametrically opposed guys, taking on DDP and Mike Graham... Mike Graham, whose only claim to fame is on WWF Talking Head documentaries, he says that Jeff Jarrett broke a million guitars and never drew, drew a dime. Oh, smart man. Uh, he, in this match, decides I'm going to big league and not sell or work with Jushin Liger on any of his offense. <laughs> it's okay. Like I, I forgive him for the great insight on Jeff Jarrett. Uh-huh. Well, listen. Jeff Jarrett's on TV every week. It's a number one program. His segments do the best on TV, even though that doesn't matter. Uh, he made evented the highest rated Dynamite or the highest rated Rampage of all time. But again, Jeff Jarrett stinks. He's the worst ever. I get it. Yeah, I'm sure that was all Jay Lethal rub is probably what it was. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so also on this day of wrestling history, 1995, ECW held, uh, their holiday hell event from the Lost Battalion Hall in New in Queens, New York. Uh, this is one of those episodes of TV that gets, or this is one of those tapings that gets a full VHS release and also was cut up for TV, right? Okay. Um, so you've probably seen a lot of this. Uh, for me, some of the most notable things is, um, I think think he was in WWE as Mantar at the time and he wrestles on this show as Bruiser Mastino which mm -hmm. was his non-Mantar gimmick 
Did he have the Mantar mask for his intro? No, he was no? he was like he was like uh, his gimmick was like he was like a mob guy, like he wrestled in a suit. Oh, all right. He's like Tony Pepperoni's like great uncle. Yeah, there you go. Um, we also get the first ever Raven versus Sandman match. Okay. And at least in ECW, the last ever Sabu Cactus Jack match. What exactly is an Olympic rules match? Because that sounds like not good for those two people. So it is cac- this is this is heel cactus. This is him uh, attempting to not give the fans what they want. Okay. And they announce it as an Olympic rules match, and they have referee Pee Wee Moore come out and run down the Olympic rules, which, again, exactly what it is. It's like a two points for a takedown, you know, the, so on and so forth. And then 911 comes out and choke slams Pee Wee Moore, and it's still technically an Olympic rules match, and Joey calls it as such, but 911 is now the referee. <laughs> Is 911 wearing a referee's shirt? No, he's just wearing his normal 911 outfit. Ah, not a commitment to the bit. I don't like it. No. And then, strangely, there's a match on here of Mikey Whipwreck taking on Two Cold Scorpio, where the TV title and the tag titles are on the line at the same time. Cactus comes out and helps Mikey win, and then just kind of gloms himself onto Mikey as the co-tag team champions. And okay. maybe you remember the promos of this time where Cactus is trying to convince Raven why Mikey would be a good member of the crew. And he just keeps yelling, fire, pizzazz, white <laughs> meat baby face keeps on kicking out. Yeah. Okay, so that's this. All right, yep. Yeah, that's and probably then, the only thing I remember. I don't remember the Sabu Cactus match. You know, obviously, I don't remember Bruiser Mas- Mastino, but right. I definitely remember uh, Mikey becoming half the tag champs there. Right. Uh, so also on this day in wrestling history, 1996, we had Starcade uh, emanating from Nashville, Tennessee. This is actually a really good show. Um, this was kind of like the beginning of the undercard on WCW being really good, and then the main events kind of stinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ultimo Dragon versus Dean Malenko, that's very good. Uh, Akira Hokuto versus Medusa, that's very good. Jushin Liger versus Rey Mysterio, that's really good. Uh, Double J versus Chris Benoit, I know you're going to be surprised by this, that's very good. Mm. Uh, Nash and Hall against Meng and Barbarian, um, you would think that, you know, maybe... Scott and Big Kev might not have their working boots on, but if you're in there with Megan Barberi and you ain't got no choice. Didn't they just talk about that match over on Final Wrestling Place? They certainly did. Okay, see, I listened. <laughs> uh, Eddie Guerrero versus DDP, and this is um, still them playing Will They, Won't They with DDP in the NWO, and Hall and Nash come out and cost DDP the match. Okay. And it's the next night at Nitro where DDP gives them both the diamond cutters and like his big baby face run is off to the races. Yeah. Luger versus the Giant. Less said about that, the better. <laughs> and then Piper versus Hogan, right? Yeah. This is the match that they had been building up since Halloween Havoc. And I learned this from Between the Sheets a couple weeks ago. Never on TV do they explicitly say that this is for the title, but never on TV do they explicitly say that it's not for the title, right? Yeah, I, we talked about this before. That like I, I had always at this time, you know, I was a Piper fan, still am, but I was like, they gotta give Piper the strap because this is a guy who's never got a run up top, and when he won that match, I was yes. ecstatic because I was like, it finally happened, and I'm like where's the belt? Where's the announcement? And I was just, I was so confused because you couldn't jump on Twitter and find out, you know, you had to right. wait till like Monday night. And then even then they didn't explain it. Well, I was mad. So Bix actually did some digging into this. He did a journalism. Was, he did a journalism. And there's an episode of WCW pro where Tony Schiavone and Bobby Heenan say that it's not for the title. Uh, and that's the only place that it was ever explicitly stated that it wasn't for the title. And no, like, old-timers or talking heads have any reasoning for this? No. Huh. So, so okay, there's no reason for it, but there, I, I, I assume that their idea was 
okay, well, we could get it. Like, it's going to be, it's going to do a huge main event anyway. It's going to do a huge buy rate. It's going to do a huge sale, which it did because it's the first Hogan Piper match in 10 years. Mm. So we don't need to have it be for the title. We could do a second one, have that one be for the title, and pop a second number and a second buy rate and a second house off of it. Yeah. It's just, I, I get that mentality, but like, have chicken shit Hogan basically say, yeah, I'll face you, but you're not getting the title and just explain it. I I think their thought process was, and we can armchair quarterback this both until we're blue in the face, was that if they explicitly said up front it wasn't for the title, um, then people would assume Piper was going to win. And that would take some of the like mystique away from the match. Okay. They could have very easily done a thing. They could have did a fake out where – Show ends. Hogan H- Piper wins. He grabs the belt. He's parading around. There's never an announcement that he won the title. Okay, but the last thing that we see in the pay per view, as Tony Schiavone says, "Folks, we're out of town. We're out of time." More on that in a moment. Is Piper holding up the belt? The next night on Nitro, we start with a Hogan promo because if you remember at World War Three, they did the contract signing. And that's where, like, they expose, like, Piper had the hip surgery and they all lay out Piper, whatever, whatever. Next night at Nitro, Hogan comes out, produces the contract, and in the contract it says it was a non-title match. Yeah. I, uh, Is that more of a bait and switch than what they actually did? I think, I, maybe, but, like, at least it makes sense with, like, wrestler brain. You know, right. you you have the big like here's you know everybody tunes into Monday night who didn't watch the pay per view maybe just heard about it. You know, you have Roddy Piper come out with the belt over big gold over his shoulder. It, it makes for at least compelling visuals, you know. Right, and you have a thing where Piper refuses to give back the belt unless Hogan signs a contract for another match, and this time it is for the title, and you know, blah blah blah. Yeah, and then Hogan says that's not going to work for me, brother, and doesn't lose the second one (laughs) exactly which we'll get into well you know what we'll say we'll get into that right now so on this day wrestling history 1997 head-to-head nitro versus raw let's get into nitro first okay yeah so this is the nitro the night after starcade yes that starcade and being that um AEW dynamite this past week was the anniversary of the infamous hogan sting starcade they absolutely missed the ball by not having Sting come out and do something on the show. Mm-hmm. But as I understand it, there were a ton of people that weren't there because of travel issues, because of how bad the weather was in uh, Colorado, thanks to Wiki. <laughs> yeah, fucking Dwicky. <laughs> but this show is like a big reset show. We have a bunch of title changes. Um, Ultimo Dragon beats Eddie for the Cruiserweight title. Booker's T beats... Uh, Disco Inferno for the TV title. Um, after, like, they had been, for weeks and weeks, they had been teasing, like, Booker T singles run, where he's wrestling, like, the big-name guys and losing. And now here he is. He gets, like, one of the secondary titles, whatever, right? Mm. Um, But th- this is the beginning of the Jericho heel turn. Nice. Uh, he has a match with Kurt Henning, and you've probably seen the GIF. Where Jericho goes to do the lion salt, and Jericho claims that this was the intended spot, but again, when it comes to Jericho, you can never know where the truth begins and the lie ends, you know? Mm -hmm. Where Jericho goes to do the lion salt, and he doesn't get the full rotation, and uh, Henning gets the knees up, but by Henning getting the knees up, he more or less, like, gets his legs up and kind of guides Jericho down to the ground so he doesn't die. (laughs) in his head. Yeah. That's definitely what they called in the back. Right. And then after Jericho loses, he snaps and he throws David Penzer to the ground. Okay. Yeah, I remember that part. Right. But this is the night after Starcade. So we get a rematch between Hogan and Sting because of the controversial finish from Starcade. Which was the uh like the Bret Hart screw drop thing, right? Th- this was the Nick Patrick fast count that wasn't a fast count. This was the seventeen minute match that had an eight minute prolonged Hulk Hogan control rest period where he just <laughs> laid in a chin lock with Sting. Um this is where Eric Bischoff claims Sting showed up in quote unquote no condition to be the champion, i.e. he didn't have a good enough tan brother. <laughs> so they're like, What are we gonna do? 
And I don't know, they should have had just Sting come out and kill Hogan and win the title. Yeah. But disputed finish at Starcade, so they have the rematch on Nitro. The match on TV goes five minutes, okay? Mm. Of those five minutes, it's three minutes of Hogan beating up Sting. Sting makes a comeback. Tony Schiavone says, folks, we're going to see if they can let us go over because we're running out of time. He throws Hogan into the corner, gives Sting- Hogan the big stinger splash. He goes for a second one. Hogan pulls the referee in the way. Folks, we're out of time, and we cut to black. Huh. Okay, I don't have any memory of this. We don't get a resolution to it until the following Thursday for the debut of Thunder, where they show the rest of the match, which has yet another disputed finish, and they decide that the WCW title is now held up. Held in abeyance? Yes. Okay. So, as much as they screwed Sting on the Starcade finish, I forgot how badly they screwed him the next night on the Nitro finish. Yeah. I, I, did WWE do so much, this much fuckery with, like, running out of time and, like, gimmicks of, we'll show you how this match ends on our next show? Like, I feel like that was more of a WCW thing. It absolutely was a WCW thing. Um, yeah. It was who, even for it was actually originally a Bill Watts thing where Bill Watts would do the thing where like you would see the finish about to happen and they would just like, oh, folks, we're out of TV time, uh, you know, tune in next week or the, or like whatever for the rest of the show. I can't think of it like there had been times during the Raw era where it would be a live Raw and we're like, oh, we're back from commercial. We literally have two minutes of TV time, and we come back to, like, Kama and The Undertaker fighting. <laughs> and, like, oh, this was the match we were supposed to have, but we're out of time. We'll see you next week, folks. And that was it. Like, it's not like it was a match that mattered. We never got it picked up the following week on Raw. <laughs> it was just like, whatever. We don't give a shit, right? Yeah, so it probably had, like, the Manhattan Center, right? Yes, it was one of those shows. Yeah, yeah. And I say it's Kama. It might have been, like, somebody, like, pre comma it might have been like head shrinker samu or something you know <laughs> yeah make so, a difference fat too so as this is going on over on nitro over on raw we have the like if if the weeks before weren't like the full russification of things we are now in the full russification things we have the opening segment with gold dust coming out as baby new year <laughs> Yep. We have Austin. We have Austin coming out, coming out and throwing him in the porta potty and knocking it over. Uh, we have Triple H, who had just won the European title the previous week on TV, but is now injured and can't defend it. Uh, he was supposed to defend it against Owen. So then Sean comes out, and then Slaughter makes Sean defend the world title against Owen that night. And this is essentially this is Owen's blow off with Sean. Okay. Um, they do a fuck finish on this where Owen has Sean and the sharpshooter Hunter hits him with the crutch and then they lay Owen out. This leads to Owen versus triple H being the feud going toward Royal rumble. Uh, this is also the beginning of Sean versus undertaker for Royal rumble. Um, there's also the, the DX promo where in the weeks that they were off China, China got, um, fake boobs. (laughs) <laughs> and it's like Sean was like it's like staring into the sun, right? And they and they keep mentioning that this is uh these are the two new members of DX in regards to her fake tits. Yeah. Um it's, all those pre it's been a while since we've had one, but all of those previous weeks where like Jim Cornette would do like the stand up promo of like, oh Phil Mushnick, you're bad because you don't like the WWE or um, you know, WCW stinks or whatever it is. Uh, this is Jim Cornette setting up the forthcoming NWA invasion angle. Yeah, and WWE always does invasion angles well. Right. Yeah. Um, this is the first episode of Raw where they mention that World Wrestling Entertainment is in negotiations, maybe, to do something in the future, we hope, with Mike Tyson. Mm-hmm. We'll see how that turns out. Led people to believe that he would wrestle or... You know, something like that. Well, okay, so they never uh, technically... Yeah, I mean, they did, but it's they another... Never like technically, the w, it's the WCW thing, where it's like, if you don't explicitly say it, you're hoping that the implication is there. 
I I think they never they never so they never officially set a match, right? Mm. And I get what you're saying. If you don't say it's a match, then if you don't say that it's not a match, then people are going to assume it's a match, right? Yeah. So this essentially is just them. So what this ends up being is it's them saying that he's going to make an appearance at the Royal Rumble. That's what they're negotiating toward. That Mike Tyson's going to make an appearance at the Royal Rumble. No different than like LT making an appearance at the Royal Rumble like two years prior or three years prior or whatever it was, right? Mm. So like when they said LT was going to be at the Royal Rumble, we didn't know he was going to – we didn't think he was going to wrestle until he has the altercation with Bam Bam Bigelow, right? Yeah. So this is where Mike Tyson, we'll get there when we get there, but Mike Tyson's just in the skybox, and he's like, yo, I love Cold Stone, he's my dude, you know? <laughs> um, but this is, so, like, as Nitro is, like, screwing up, dropping the ball, doing these fuck finishes, you know, Raw is kind of lining up their puzzle pieces the right way, and, like, making the announcement of the Mike Tyson thing and all this other stuff. But I would say the most important thing that happened on this Raw, it's the thing that everyone remembers, <laughs> so after weeks and weeks of the New Age Outlaws two-on-one attacking poor Dude Love and poor Mankind, this time Cactus Jack comes out to take on the Road Dog. But this time Cactus Jack has backup because the whole night on the stage for Raw, there's been a wooden box. <laughs> and as a once great man once said, anyone who comes out of a box is instantly over. And this is the Monday Night Raw debut of Chainsaw Charlie. Yeah, so this totally legit chainsaw is just giving off sparks everywhere. Stop it. <laughs> hey, I have the figure. I'm allowed to say that. That's right. And everyone always shits on WWF. It's like, oh, why did they call Terry Funk Chainsaw Charlie? You should, just should have let him be Terry Funk, right? Yep, that's what I said like a week or two ago. Terry Funk has gone on record and said that the Chainsaw Charlie thing was his idea. Well, he's he's middle aged and crazy. <laughs> I uh, emphasis on was, crazy. It was a nickname for a barber in their town when they were kids, and like you would come out of the barber, and like you know, in the fifties, everyone would get like the same like you know the same haircut, you know. Yeah, government issued practice. Right, and they would joke around and say that this guy butchered you like a regular chainsaw Charlie, and that's where the name came from. It was Terry Funk's idea. And the look and everything else was, like, a, based on a variety of different things. But, like, within three weeks, he's still wearing the same goofy outfit, but they're just calling him Terry Funk, you know? Yeah. All right. Yeah, I, I watched the video today, you know, and I, I thought about your box comment. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my box. Yes, Joe and his box. <laughs> but, so that's it. Right. It was a busy day in wrestling history, which I always love. You know me. Yeah, interesting time in uh, Raw and SmackDown, or Raw and Nitro, you know? This is definitely, you know, this is definitely the point where, like, Raw is making its way up, and S Nitro's making its way down. Yeah, but I mean, we still have some good WCW stuff to look forward to. We get to have Jericho in his list of 1,001 holds. Right. For sure. So I'm yeah. not saying that there's not good stuff in the mid card and the cruiserweight division and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, just the top but of the card is a mess. <laughs> top of the, this is officially the beginning of the top of the card in WCW being a disaster, and the top of the card in WWF starting to finally come together. Yeah. All right. I guess all it's right, time. So for, I was going to say it's time for the well, we, what we talked about this month, or what we watched, or did whatever. <laughs> Why yeah, that's transition. exactly what it is. <laughs> <sighs> I guess I'll go first. That's the way this usually goes. You go first. I know. I, it's, I, I, I don't know. It's all, I'm frazzled. Anyways, <laughs> we teased it before, and I guess we'll talk about it now, but uh, you and I went to a wrestle. That's right. We did go to the uh, wrestling at the LVAC, Sokol's. Uh, gentleman's club, not a gentleman's club, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yes, and you know what that makes us, Joe? Uh, not cowards. Right, there you go. It makes us not cowards. I agree. Yeah, uh, you know, it was a little cold out, but other than that, you know, it's like, hey, we say we're going to go someplace, we go. You know, we're men of our word, high upstanding individuals, and uh, I had a good time. A lot, lot more people showed up than I thought with all the people, you know, dropping out from the weather and, uh, 
equipment, whatever, having travel issues. Um, it's a good show. Like, obviously, uh, the big news coming out of LVAC is we have a baby face turn from Big oh. Dan. Big Dan champion turns on Sydney Bacabella. Sydney got up in Dan's face, and uh, finally uh, Dan has had enough, and he's sent out a bunch of not at all unsettling tweets saying how much he loves the Lehigh Valley and loves us. <laughs> I kind of get weird heebie-jeebies when I read those. But, uh, yeah, Dan's the, Dan's a good guy now, so that's the, the big news coming out of the main event. But uh, I had a pretty good time at the show. Just a pretty good time? A oh, pretty good time. <laughs> the only person who gets a pass for not going to the show is Brett because he was actually sick. Yeah. Uh, everybody else, I say, jacques, no <laughs> excuses. Um, it could have been on your tombstone that you were lifelong wrestling fans when you died on your way to or from the show. <laughs> this is true. And uh, I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't point this out. I know this was uh, addressed on other podcasts, but... Somebody bumped <sighs> way too much. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. Like, I'm we'll, not going to we'll, name names. We'll, we'll, go f- we'll go from there. And I will say, after he took uh, his first bump, and it was kind of like a face first bump, where like, they yeah. kind of pick you up and like flapjack you, uh-huh. he so- like, you know where the ring is. He sold out of the ring over to commentary to make <laughs> sure to tell me that that one didn't count. <laughs> I think he hit his head too hard. He's got wrestler brain. If that one did, uh huh. <laughs> now I'll give him that one. But mm-hmm. I'm not. What am I? What are we going to do for the other three that he had in the match? Yeah. <laughs> now some may say that he was compensating for other people in the match. Others might say he was probably trying to show off for Mantis. Yeah. <laughs> um, six of one, half a dozen the other. But I'm listen. Dan has always been a baby face to me. He's always loved the Lehigh Valley, and he's always loved us. He's just had a bad way of showing it. <laughs> and I think a lot of it was the negative influence of who he surrounded himself with. But yeah. now that he's away from the evil influence of Sidney Bacabella, and he's with some nicer people like Mantis and the Batiri and Simon Sutherland and your folks like that, I think we'll get to see the kinder, gentler Dan that we've <laughs> all known and loved for all these years, you know? After the show, you know, we're all kind of standing around, you know, getting ready to leave. Uh, Dan walks by me and he shoves me. And I'm like, you're supposed to be a baby face. What are you doing? Aww. <laughs> he forgot already or something about me just elicits shoving. But I, uh, I think it was definitely something about you. Yeah. But I'll just say um, and, and I, you don't have to reply to this at all. Uh, these opinions are only those of myself. But. You know, I, I make no uh, secret that I am not proud of, like, my commentary. You know, a lot of times people are like, oh, didn't you do commentary on this show? And I'm like, no, no, it's scratch, scratch from record. It never happened. Don't, don't look it up. And sometimes I feel bad that I got paid to do those shows. But, like, whenever I feel, like, kind of guilty, then I remember that people pay Veda Scott to wrestle, and I don't feel so bad. So uh, I appreciate that. It was a little bit of a a, a Christmas gift to myself. But uh, again, no need to reply, but I just wanted to say that. Lucky 13 versus Young Jay Lee to open up the show was really good. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, Uh, and Cheeseburger versus uh, Speedball was really uh, good. Yeah, both two really, really good matches, Um, you know, top to bottom, you know. And listen, these LVAC shows aren't your five stars, seven stars if you're in the to- Tokyo Dome sort of <laughs> shows. But every now and then when there's like a good match like that or like a borderline great match that happens, um, you know, we'll tout it here to the world. I don't think it's out on uh, IWTV yet, but obviously when it w- is, we'll make sure to boost it and signal boost it. Uh, yeah. Definitely watch the whole show. I think like bell to bell. It'll be just a hair under two hours. It'll only end up being five matches because the, the Buffalo car couldn't make it, which when I woke up on Friday and I saw at 6 o'clock they called for a state of emergency in that area of New York, I'm like, yeah, they ain't making it, you know? Yeah. Um, and, so uh, things, we almost things got make. shuffled <laughs> around in, a, a bit, but uh, like it was top to bottom. It was a great show, a fun show, a really energetic crowd as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, it was a lot more people than I, I thought, just because, you know, we hit some patches of snow uh, 
in my attempt to be a cheap boy and avoid tolls. Uh, but I was like, oh, man, if some people are coming from certain areas, you know, and obviously friends of ours decided that it wouldn't be uh, necessarily a good idea to make the travel. So I expected a lot smaller crowd, but it was I don't want to say at capacity, but especially around the ring, it was just as packed as it ever is at Sokol's. For sure. You know, and it's always a good crowd at the LBAC shows. Never any troublemakers. Uh, very rarely any crowd comedians. You know, um, oh, no, not at all. Sometimes the uh, drive-in shows may um, attract one or two looky loos, but they pretty much get ignored or shot down. You know. Oh yeah, I, I fucking shut that shit right down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like I said, we'll we'll you know when we see that it goes up on uh, Jerry's Internet Wrestling Emporium, we'll be sure to let the world know. You know. Heck yeah. And uh, any insight on when we're getting another show? Nope, I have not been tipped off as to anything yet. Uh, Usually I'll get a text uh, confirming. Now that there has been uh, a bit of a management reshuffling uh, in the LVAC board of directors, (laughs) uh, usually that one of the good things about it is I'll actually get a text that says like, hey, are you available on this date well in advance? You know, as opposed (laughs) opposed to me having to to hear it. I was going to say, as opposed to re- seeing it on social media and just being like, oh, I assume that you're going to be there, right? <laughs> or as opposed to be hearing about a fourth hand and having to ask Mantis, and he's like, oh, I thought I told you. <laughs> um, but it was a good show. I'm looking forward to 2023 uh, for LVAC, and I'm glad uh, the show went off without any incidents, you know? Yeah, you know, it was a blast, and I'm glad that I kept my consecutive LVAC streak alive. Yes. Me too. <laughs> I'm glad you're not a coward. I'm I'm not definitely not a coward. I showed up. Right. So, uh, it was announced this week that at the Royal Rumble this year, Mountain Dew presents the Pitch Black match brought to you by Mountain Dew Pitch Black. <laughs> okay? Okay. Now, Adam, I don't know what the hell a Pitch Black match is. There's a lot of speculation that that's going to be what the L.A. Knight versus the Fiend match is going to be. I just assume that, like, a lot of times during the match, the lights will go out. The lights go out. Is this going to be, like, their new take on what a blindfold match is, maybe? Uh, maybe just a lights out match where it's unsanctioned and they flick the lights real quick before sh- the match starts. Right. There's also speculation that this might be the Fiend Finn Balor versus Brood Edge match. The Fiend what? Finn Balor? Or the, 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 what's, what the hell is his the demon? The, the demon, demon Finn Balor. It, listen, okay. we're all the Fiend at this point. We're all Fiend-pilled. Okay. Um, but there's speculation as to what the match is. I don't know what this match is. Does this sound like a bad idea on paper? Probably. Um, do I hope if it is the LA Knight Bray Wyatt match? that L.A. Knight gets a big, nice payday out of it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm already not liking where this could be going, you know? His pay-per-view bonus is going to be a couple cases of Mountain Dew. Hey, listen, you can sell that to people. People are into, like, these, like, um... Terrible shitty, drinks. <laughs> shitty versions of Mountain Dew that they only have for a limited time, you know? Yeah. Maybe they keep them, like, mint in can and, like, yeah. save them for future. But I'm, you know, I, I'm kind of disappointed. We're like, we're like four weeks away from the Royal Rumble, and we don't even have like, other than Cody's wishy washy promo on Raw, Raw this past week, we don't have anyone who's officially announced their candidacy to be in the World Wrestling Entertainment's 2023 Royal Rumble from the sold out Alamo Dome this, you know, on the 28th of January. <laughs> I want to know. I didn't watch any of that recap show on Monday. Uh, I watched the Cody promo. Yeah, no, I'm I'm good. I I honestly, when I saw on Twitter that like they had the interview, at the time I didn't know it was a recap show. So, like I just thought that like, hey, we have an interview with Cody on the Tron or something like that. And I remember being mad, not mad because I, I don't have the nightmare narcotic running through me. But like I said, the ne- they should have never tipped the hand that Cody still exists until he shows up at the Rumble. You know, I'm of the mindset that like surprises are more valuable than him showing up on a recap show, you know? Um, I think their idea was to get people to tune in because Cody does and has popped a number for WWE. 
But who's this, not watching the Rumble? This isn't backlash. No, no, no. Listen to me. I I, I think they did the uh, the deal with Cody's promo on Raw to get people to watch a Raw recap oh, okay. show. I gotcha. Yeah. But you could just do what I did and just look at it on Twitter. Right. But that, but that thing, Cody didn't officially announce that he was in the Royal Rumble, but he certainly like, pussyfooted around it that he was. Yeah. And uh, I guess he, like, talked uh, glowingly about Seth Rollins, so maybe we're getting more of that. There's There's been talk that they, they feel as though they have one more match in that feud. And I'm like, didn't they already have, like, seven matches on pay-per-view for that feud? It feels like it. Yeah. I mean, if your first match is at WrestleMania, you don't need to have seven more matches. That should have been a one and done, but that's just me. They ran it up to Hell in the Cell, which was, like, I think four months they ran that program for. Yeah. And Cody won them all. <laughs> I don't know why they kept redoing it, but whatever, man. Like, things are different now in the world wrestling entertainment, I guess. Yeah. Well, future world champ right there, Cody. Can't yeah, wait for him to dethrone Roman. He's yeah. going to be the one that beats Roman, for sure. Ugh. Any, sure. You got anything else? Uh, you know what? I do. I was going to go and do a deep dive into Wendy Chu's upset win over Cora Jade on NXT this past week. Uh, but I'm not going to because we have breaking news, breaking about an hour or two before we started recording. Oh, I was and, taking a nap. What happened? Uh, that is that the uh, what I perceived and many perceived as being the true reigning absolute and intense champion of AIW, Matt Cardona, he actually rechristened the titles as the real world's champion of AIW. So um, I'm glad that there's some clarity in the AIW like title picture. Um, I don't necessarily agree that, uh, you know, people are poo pooing his, his second reign with these belts. Well, technically it's his first reign because he never really lost them, but I'm glad that he came out and made a statement about it. I think that that's really important that people see that. Um, I don't watch broski promos on, uh, like on purpose. Like if it's in the course of something that I'm watching, like, and I can't fast forward past it, <laughs> I'll agree unfortunately watch a broski promo but if something shows up on social media and it's just a broski promo i'm like oh i don't need to watch that like i gain nothing from watching this <laughs> see I'll, I'll i'll tag you in it i'll make sure you oh thanks see. yeah I'll, I'll get i'll get your eyes on it you know uh but yeah i'm glad broski cut a promo for brian's <laughs> match uh friday against wes barkley yeah uh, added stipulation, winner gets to go to Broski's New Year's Eve party. <laughs> this is true. I hope Wes uh, doesn't uh, bump into anything in the toy room. Uh, yes, it, Wes already does the the Scott Hall walk pretty much wherever he goes, so he's got no problem. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what else you got, Joe? So, Dynamite this week, right? Uh, mm-hmm. I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, there were some travel issues. A lot of big names weren't there. Uh a lot of big names that they were building stuff to and for the January 4th show. Um, couldn't get to the show. And I understand, like, definitely for Rampage, some audibles need to be called for some matches. But none of that matters. I've never been a Wardlow guy. Like, I, it took me a while to get Wardlow, but I'm like, okay, I get him. He's not my guy, but I get him. I love Samoa Joe. I've been a Samoa Joe fan for 20 years, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't think Joe should have won that match. I think Wardlow should have won that match. Um, and then after the match, uh, Joe not only lays Wardlow out, but cuts his hair. Yeah. And then Darby comes out and steals all Wardlow's heat. And I'm just like, poor Wardlow. <laughs> you know, like, I think they had built him up and the whole deal that they did with Max doing the stretcher job for him, no selling the stretcher job, and then, like, no follow-up on that, killed Wardlow dead. Hopefully he could still be over after this, and, you know, obviously, it's not like, I'm gonna be like, well, this guy's dead, I'm never gonna cheer him. I wasn't cheering him in the first place. I just feel bad that they, like, really made him look like a goof on on TV this week. Yeah, it's tough, because I agree with you, And it's very odd that we would say 
that anybody who loses to Samoa Joe, like we're mad that like Samoa Joe got the win because it's like Samoa Joe, like just like you, one of my favorites. So if Samoa Joe kills somebody, that just makes sense. But Wardlow, especially if you compare it to his rise, like him kind of having dissension with MJF and the crowds getting behind him and even going to bed when he was murdering security people and smart Mark was suing him. Like all of that stuff seems like it was a hundred years ago. Yes. You know, he just doesn't have that allure. Uh, maybe the war Joe stuff also helped kill it because that was all death how that was just kind of how ended a bunch of rampages after a couple weeks. Um, just really bad booking. And like, yeah, the fact that not only did he not lose via a fuck finish or a referee stoppage because of the leg or something that you can kind of work your way around, he lost clean, you know, to a choke out and then get his hair cut off. Uh, it, it's like, he got bitched out and, uh, it, it, yeah, it does make them look pretty weak. And uh, I feel like they had a star on their hands three months ago, four w- months ago. And I'm not saying he's going to like disappear or go to the bottom of the card because they can fix this, maybe. But he's not the star he was three months ago. Three months ago, you're like, all right, this guy could be world champ in a year. But now you're like, man, I really hope he gets TV time. <laughs> you know, it, it's a lot has changed over the last couple of months with him. Yeah, it's a bummer, but what are you going to do, you know? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, I hate to say it, but if I have to choose who's got my TV killing people, uh, Samoa Joe or Wardlow, and I can only pick one, I'm going to take Samoa Joe. Yeah. And Samoa Joe beating the tar out of Darby Allen is going to make for great television. Uh, they had that great match a couple weeks yeah. ago on that one really good episode of of Dynamite. I keep on to say Nitro. Dynamite, where there was like 15 <laughs> things that happened and like. We're like, oh, yeah, and Joe and Darby had this great match, and I think they're going to have, like, a killer match on, you know, the first Dynamite of the new year, and then, like, where does Wardlow go, you know? Like, at yeah. this point, I would have um, Hobbs come back and squish Wardlow out in, like, 30 seconds to, like, m- like get the last bit of juice that Wardlow might have to do something with Hobbs. Yeah, put over, put over Hobbs or... I was going to say even hook or something like that, but I can see just because what they did with Sammy Guevara, they just stuck him back with Jericho. I can see Wardlow going back to MJF somehow. Yeah. Just th- them just doing a reset and be like, let's, let's try to figure this out again. Yeah. He, he's definitely one of those guys that like, um, AEW, like, you know, we always complain like, Oh, this guy's not on TV and that guy's not on TV and whatever it is. Um, and obviously there's been so much that has happened with turnarounds and travel and so on and so forth with AEW. And I know we mentioned it all the time here that Tony needs to have like a year plan. He needs to have like these three to six month cycles where you cycle guys in and out because you have so many goddamn guys in the roster that like you're always going to have the acclaimed on TV because they're the champions. You're always going to have Jamie Hayter. You're always going to have Moxley, you know, even though he deserves a vacation. Right. Yeah. But, like, there's certain guys, there's, like, a group of, like, 8 to 12 guys that are always, guys and girls that are always on TV, and then you have your next set that are on, like, every other TV, and then you have your next set that are on, like, that three-month thing, that you're going to cycle them in when you cycle out the other group, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, like, okay, in this three-month time frame, let's say somebody out of this group catches on, will they move up to group two where they're not on every week of TV, but they're like on every other week of TV, right? Yeah. And then they sink or swim. Okay, then they maybe move up to that 12. We're like, okay, now we're going to give Moxley his vacation. So we're elevating people, but we're not killing people completely. But I definitely think Wardlow needs that like three months off TV and come back with like a renewed something, you know? Yeah. Get him a uh, fresh uh, paint of coat. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so that's really all I got. It's been a, a lean week, you know? Yeah, honestly, if it wasn't for the little broski bet, I would have been hard-pressed to even talk about a second thing because mm. wrestling, you know, Dynamite was fun, but uh, not much meat on the bone for me. Yeah. All right, well, let's get into uh, our homework that I assigned from this past week. Oh, do we have to? Yes. <laughs> Homework. Homework. And 
It's an obligation you owe your family and yourself. Home, 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 work. Homework, it's an obligation you owe your family and yourself. Hey, so I assigned to Adam and everyone else to watch the 1987 Slammys Awards, which is not available on the Peacock or World Wrestling Entertainment Network. It's freely available on YouTube, uh, even though there's like a bit or two missing because it's very clearly off someone's uh, videotape that they might have missed a segment or two. Yeah, and at uh, the e- at the very end, there's uh, the beginning of Married with Children. I was excited for a second that something <laughs> was going to be watchable on this. Yes. Uh, so Adam is being uh, rotten because this is something that took place before ni- uh, 1990. Uh, you go over to our friend Kevin's uh, blog, mass- or MassLibrary.com, read his write-up of this. He thoroughly enjoyed this. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Obviously, Adam, you have no heart. You have no soul. You hate fun. Go ahead I mean, and talk to me about this show. I I, I, I do like fun. Uh, I agree with you the first two points. And I will say, uh, let me just get this right out the rip. Uh, I hated this. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I, there was a couple things that I popped for, but I can count them on less than one hand. Um, and I'll get into it when I get into it. And I'm not shitting on it because it happened in 1987 or the production quality or like, obviously the production quality is one thing, but watching it on a YouTube rip of a VHS, I'm not, it, it, it's just bad and I'll get into it as we go. But this might be one of my least favorite things you've ever assigned. Holy shit. You suck. (laughs) Uh, apparently, but as you said, the 1987 Slammy Awards, uh, I had to play a game of who's still alive as I was watching this just to kind of entertain myself. But, Joe, it's not the Oscars, the Emmys, the Tonys, or the Grammys. It's the 37th in a row annual Slammy Awards. Uh, I guess it was kind of entertaining seeing everybody come in a, a very long and drawn out introduction with different vehicles like... You know, some people were in limos and Brutus Beefcake was cutting somebody's hair in like a mobile barber shop, which I guess was a thing in 87. But uh, very long introductions at the beginning and of all the individual wrestlers. And the, the, heart, yet, the, the heart Foundation showing up in the ambulance with construction paper hearts on the side. Yeah. And this very clearly was supposed to be a red carpet thing where Gene was interviewing people as they arrived, and we only got clips. Yeah. And I'm so sad. I wanted the full version of this. This has been added to my list of like footage in the vault that has to exist at World Wrestling Entertainment. Like I want the full like three hour taped version of this as opposed to like the hour ten minutes that we ended up getting. Oh, it felt like it was three hours, but. Uh, and just to get just to give you a time frame, this was taped on December sixteenth, okay? Uh-huh. And I would have bet it was taped earlier only because like who was there and who wasn't there. Um it was very interesting that like people who were heavily pushed on TV at the time, like let's just say like Don Morocco, Ken Patera, Billy Jack Haynes, and I say heavily pushed, they were like featured mid card acts, were nowhere to be seen, right? They were they not were, there. Were they leaning heavier on, like, the gimmicked personalities? Well, again, like, come on. Like, there were people on here who weren't gimmicked personalities, but, you know, you could have had... So then you have the last cart that shows up, which is the and the rest cart for the baby faces, <laughs> where it's the Killer Bees, Hillbilly Jim, the Haiti Kid... Uh, Ultimate Warrior and Ultimate Warrior. Ultimate Warrior was like an, a, a, a the and 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 the rest guy at this point. You know, he hadn't had his big glow up that he would have in a couple months. You know, he should have ran down the street. He shouldn't have been in a vehicle. He wasn't the fully formed warrior yet. You know, he didn't have all of those. Like he hadn't figured it out yet. You know. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we have a Vince introduction, uh, and for some reason it sounded like he's like talking like a preacher or like Dusty Rhodes or something like that. Like he had an accent on him when he's uh, you know welcoming everybody to the Slammies. And our hosts are Mean Gene Okerlund and Jesse the Body Ventura. And one of the things that popped me, 
I'm going to say pop number one was how they were going to explain how the votes are tabulated, and that is because of the Academy of Sports and Sciences, a.k.a. ASS, and Jack from ASS, Jack Tunney, uh, came out and was, like, booed. But uh, I, I do like the silly little bit of that. It felt like kind of like a naked gun type gimmick, like a Leslie Nielsen type thing, uh, just in its execution. So I appreciated that. And I was hoping when that line happened that we were going to get a bunch of that. And I was sad that like that was the only thing of that comedy styling. Well, I'll, I'll say this, even though he's not in the credits, I think he's technically in there as K Fabe in the credits at the end. Uh, this is one of the first things that my sweet Brucey produced for WWE. And I could certainly feel as though this was Bruce trying to write like a naked gun type movie, but he only had one joke in him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a shame. Uh, they should have uh, shelved this for another year or two until they could have got more of that stuff. Anyways, we're going right into the awards. The first award is Best Performance by an Animal. And your nominees are Damien, Frankie, uh, the parrot or whatever, <laughs> Matilda, the bulldog, and George, the animal steel, because obviously it's it's animals. And George Steele wins. Uh, he's confused. He goes in the wrong direction and eventually finds his way up to the podium where he eats the turnbuckle pad that's on the podium. Uh, this was light fun. George the Animal Steel was an old man who was barely mobile in 1987, but was still wrestling another 10 to 13 years later, you know? So, good for George. Uh, you call it fun. Uh, I call it the first time when I checked how much was left of this recording. <laughs> oh, how dare you. Uh, next up, we had uh, apparently they're going to do a bunch of musical numbers to showcase the potential best song of the year nominees. First up was the Intercontinental Champion, Honky Tonk Man. And uh, he does his I'm a honky tonk man thing. And we get Brett and Anvil dancing, which was the most personality I've ever seen out of Bret Hart in his entire career. Wow. You're only the 45th person to make that joke who's uh, on the wrong side of history. Good for uh, you. Well, OK. Well, I, I don't didn't see the other ones that are right. But uh, the song went on way too long. I feel like for a song that only has like one verse, uh, the fact that like I heard it 10 times. It is. Uh, what? It is three verses. It, it is three verses and three choruses. It was bad. Uh, and then I thought about how all the dancers are probably like grandmas now, and I got sad. Oh, the slammy dancers, you mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Were you, even though I said that this was... That, like, you didn't need me to tell you that this was taped on December 16, 1987. Every girl on the show's hair told you the exact day that this was filmed. <laughs> Yeah, and like the one that was presenting over on the right podium was was the most 1980s girl in the history of girls, you know? Right. Now, I didn't get a chance to, and I'm surprised Kevin didn't. This might be like bonus work for you and him to do. Uh, in the credits at the end where they list the slammy dancers, I didn't cross-reference any of those <laughs> girls to see if they um, worked in any other forms of adult entertainment. I mean, they were professional. I mean, they were choreographed dancers. That's probably yeah? the same thing. They're, I mean, I don't know. They didn't give off that much of a stripper vibe to me. Uh, listen, we, listen, it takes all kinds is all I'm saying. Uh, but I was shocked, and we'll, we'll get into it. We're the only one that this wasn't lip synced. This was actually Honky Tonk singing. Uh, obviously, the musical track was a track that they were playing because that really wasn't Jesse playing the piano. <laughs> Next, you're going to tell me that Bam Bam Bigelow wasn't playing the sax later on. Uh, he was definitely holding it up to his mouth. <laughs> well, I can tell you that he wasn't playing it because he wasn't saying into it saxophone. Okay. Which is how you play the saxophone, right? Uh, sure. Uh, so next up, we have Jimmy Hart and Honky Tonk Man are going to present the Women of the Year Award. And your nominees are Sensational Sherry, Dolly Parton, maybe? <laughs> Fabulous Moolah, Yoko Ono, sure, and Miss Elizabeth. Uh, and Miss Elizabeth wins, and she thanks Macho Man. And this is the point where I decided I want a figure of formal wear Macho Man Randy Savage. Okay. Um, I love the Macho Man. If you don't love the Macho Man, I think you might be a bad person. Um, 
I would want the version of Macho when he comes out later to present where he has, like, the full Macho Man cape and everything. Uh Uh-huh. Because when he comes out in just the one-piece deal with the dicky, um, you can really tell that it's an upper body business. Uh, (laughs) Didn't really do much to help accentuate the Macho Man's uh, skinny legs, you know? (laughs) Um, but that was a rarely worn cape by the Macho Man. I'm not Conrad when it comes where I could tell you, you know, every time Ric Flair wore a cape. But I don't think Macho Man wore this particular black and silver until, like, SummerSlam 89. Yeah. Like, that's that's how specific of a cape this is. Okay. Uh, so next up, Joe, uh, I hope whoever watches this this Slammy Awards show, I hope they're fans of Hacksaw Jim Duggan because this <laughs> is the first dosage of a nonstop buffet of Hacksaw Jim Duggan stuff. You would think he's Hulk Hogan with how much Duggan is at the forefront of this show. Um, so Hacksaw comes out to present. He says, uh, I'm, ke- I, I'm keeping one eye on fashion and one on the nominees for best fashion. Get it? Because he's cross-eyed. But right. your nominees are uh, Demolition, and uh, I do like Demolition in their formal attire as well. Uh, Macho Man, Honky Tonk Man, King Harley Race, and the British Bulldogs. The Bulldogs are the only people in actual tuxes. And Harley Race wins. And Bobby Heenan comes up. Anytime I see Bobby Heenan, I'm happy. Uh, he's got a bow tie covering up his neck brace. And uh, I was like, oh, wow, ripping off the quintessential stud muffin, Joel Gertner. Uh, Joel, unlike Mark McGuire, who wouldn't stop at until he hit 70, I'm happy to be stuck at 69, Gertner. Uh, just, oh, boy. <laughs> I like that one. Uh, and that leads to, like, a fight. Uh, it was real brief. It didn't at all act as a narrative throughout the whole show and and way stay past its welcome uh but there was a, a backstage brawl between harley race and hacksaw jim duggan and then there was donkeys and chickens and later on llamas because of course that's comedy well listen this was brucey's first thing and you forgot about um them messing up the makeup area, them fighting into the women's room, well, them yeah, fighting mean, into more. the Christmas banquet. Yeah, I got that as it happens chronologically, but... Oh, okay. And then, yeah. like, there's no less than two, like, for a bullshit backstage brawl at a fake award show for fake wrestling, Harley Race takes a table bump and Bobby Heenan takes a table bump in 1987. It, was this the first WWE hardcore match? Uh, I would say this was where the hardcore division begins. Like ECW's um, uh, whatever is going to be drawn to this uh, this uh, brawl here. And I will say uh, I knew that this, you know, I know then and I know now that this um, this award might have been rigged to get Duggan and Race together to brawl because best dress should have been a tie between Slick. Uh, when Slick comes up later, Slick looks fantastic. And King Kong Bundy, who just wore his regular gear and a top hat. (laughs) Yeah, I could see that. Uh, Next. Oh, and also during one of the many, many brawls, uh, they made uh, um, Grill Monsoon made reference to the fact that Brutus Beefcake was out on the dais, like uh, announcing the nominees for best head. Uh, and the winners were uh, a tie between Bam Bam Bigelow and Mean Gene, uh, although we never saw any of it, but we were told it was happening. Right, so there's, I do remember from the original airing, there's a bit where Bam Bam is quote-unquote tattooing Gene's head. Okay. And it wasn't included in this version that we saw, but I vividly remember it from the original airing when I saw it, you know, uh, very old. All right, so uh, next we have, uh, I actually skipped this only because what? only because you've showed it to me a bunch of times. So it's it was the only thing that I didn't need to see for the first time, but that was obviously Vince performing Stand Back along with uh, the former, back. P- former potential member of Metallica, Hulk Hogan on bass. Hulk Hogan, his backup band, excuse me, Vince's backup band was Hulk Hogan and the Hulkamaniacs. Oh, okay, sure. (laughs) 
but there's I've there's seen- nothing better on these shows, and I say these shows, like anything WWF from like 1986 until 1990, is Jesse subtly burying Vince to his face. <laughs> yeah, no, I could see that. Uh, Duggan and Harley Race are still fighting. Uh, Harley and Heenan are both buried under a giant pile of empty boxes. I literally wrote down, this sucks in my notes. Uh, however, business is about to pick up because now they're fighting in the women's dressing room. And I take it back. This part was cool. Uh, next up, we have Hulk Hogan presenting the Real American Award, and this is more of like a lifetime achievement thing because there isn't nominees. Um, uh, basically, he oh during the presentation he says that Hulkamaniacs are a real turn on for him. Uh, that was interesting. Uh-huh. Um, and at this point, I looked at uh, the time again, and I realized that this is ruining my YouTube algorithm. But your winner is Superstar Billy Graham. And then there's more fighting in catering, as you mentioned, or at the Christmas party, whatever. Right. That's where Bobby Heenan takes an atomic drop through a table for no reason. Um, Also, in his promo to bring Billy Graham out to the stage, Hulk Hogan says, man, 13 times. (laughs) Uh, It's a shame, because he's usually such a good promo. Brother. Brother. Dude. I was hoping for more brothers than mans, but I'll take what I can get. Well, Hogan wasn't quite fully cooked yet either. You know, he was just a young boy in 1987. <laughs> mm. uh, Jesse the Body Award. Uh, this is actually, like, I, I like Jesse the Body, uh, so this was interesting. But uh, the nominees are Ravishing Rick Rude, Butch Reed, The Ultimate Warrior, uh, Women's Champ Sensational Sherry. I didn't know that there was a women's title around this time, but I wasn't watching. So, And Hercules. And the winner is Rick Rude, who uh, does, like, his little bit of a dance that I'm used to from when, you know, his taunt in the video games and when he'd take the robe off and tell everybody to shut up. But he continues to uh, tear away his pants and get completely naked. So this is my question to you, Joe, because I did not see Rick Rude until he was, like, Intercontinental Champ. Was he doing, like, a full-on stripper gimmick, like, early, around this time, or was this, like, a one-time thing? So definitely a one-time thing here in the World Wrestling Entertainment, Uh, but definitely the idea was was that he was a Chippendales-style, like, dancer person. Well, sure. Yeah, like, I always got that he was, like, a male dancer, but, like, he always just does, like, the the pelvis swiggle, Yeah, you know? Uh, But this is, like, the first time where he's got a full-blown dance and he's got the little Chippendales collar that, like, he didn't really have much later on i just didn't know if it was more of a pronounced gimmick at the time no this was definitely a situation where like oh everybody's in tuxes the chippendales wear tuxes this is kind of what rick rude is we're gonna have him try to show his dick on tv gotcha (laughs) uh it was an entertaining segment and then he grabs the 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 super 1980s girl that was presenting and takes her to the back and throws the towel back out that had a little bit of like an old-timey and by old timey, I mean like seventies and sixties, like variety hour charm to it. You know, it, it, it was like all of that, and say what you will about it, like rude coming out and doing the whole dance and like playing to the crowd was like very baby face. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. You like, know, like you didn't want you weren't booing him because you were actually entertained by that. Right, right. Yeah, so that might have been the second thing that popped me for the whole show. I'm getting you around. Yeah, I don't know. You're gonna lose me in a second. Next up, we have. Uh, what is announced as like kind of like a medley of musical hits of 1987, but it's really just hit me with your best shot, yeah. uh, the one song, and it's a bunch of like recaps of, of of things that were happening in the year in the ring. Uh, this is an award, uh, I guess, uh, but no, it's just uh, them basically saying here's a bunch of videos, and then we're gonna pick the best one. But oh wait, here's more Duggan and Harley Race fighting first. But your nominees are Andre the Giant, who I don't believe was there. No. Uh, Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Uh, glad that he's getting some screen time. Honky Tonk Man, Strike Force, and Bam Bam Bigelow. And Joe Honky, or I'm sorry, Hacksaw Jim Duggan once again wins. Uh, actually, this is his. Is this his first one? No, he this is his first one. Yeah, he wins again later. Spoiler. So we have 75 fight scenes. We have him presenting, and he wins two awards. Like, okay. All right, go this ahead. Is, 
Adam, this is the time where WF is running three crews: an A show, a B show, and a C show. Is this Hogan the is, C show we're watching? No, stop it. Hogan is main eventing the A shows. Macho's main eventing the B shows. Duggan's main eventing the C shows. This is their way to feature essentially their number three baby face in a pronounced package. Outside of Duggan, the only other baby, like Hogan literally has like two scenes, right? He has the scene where he's pay- playing guitar with Vince and him cutting the promo for the Real American Award, right? Yeah. Macho Man is like all over this thing, right? Whether like they're focusing on him in the crowd, he comes out and does the thing with Elizabeth, he comes out later and presents an award. Outside of Macho, the next most person that's on the show obviously is Duggan. It's them trying to highlight their three biggest baby faces. We don't need to spend a time on, enough to, a ton of time on Hogan. He's already over. We need to spend a little bit of time on Macho, but we need to spend a lot more time in getting Duggan to be perceived at that same level as a Macho Man or a Hulkster. This is why I enjoyed all the Duggan stuff. I. I this is why wrestling in 1987 sucked. If Hacksaw Jim Duggan is one of your top three guys, like, See, you're you lucky. you are such a negative Nancy. There was a thing going around on Twitter the other day of, like, who's someone that you've been told for years is bad? And essentially, just let's just say Dave Meltzer has told us this person is bad or these people are bad. And when you go and you watch their stuff, they're actually good. Duggan is one of those few people that are actually good. When we get to like 94, 95, he's slowing down a little bit and maybe he's not working. He's working smarter and not harder. But I tell you, man, up until like 88, 89, like we're not even counting his Mid-South stuff. So it's before you started watching wrestling. Duggan was awesome. Like even go watch the stuff on Raw. Like when he's pretty much washed and he has the like the two or three match program at Shawn. And again, yes, it's Shawn Michaels, but it's not fully formed Shawn Michaels. And Duggan like makes Michaels looks like a million bucks. And Duggan could have went out there and sandbagged him and, like, not sold for him or not helped him at all. And Duggan went out there and busted his ass on Monday Night Raw in the early days of this in 93 and helped make Sean a little bit, you know? If if I watched this when I was seven years old in 1987, I might have liked Hacksaw Jim Duggan, but there's nothing about Hack... You, you can say that he puts people over and he put his working boots on, but at the end of the day... He was a shoulder block, body slam, punch kick guy, and uh, the most important moves in all of professional wrestling. Yes. All right, we can agree to disagree on this one. You're not winning me. You're not convincing me to uh, to, to, to to appreciate hacksaw. I'm sorry. Maybe Canadian Team Canada hacksaw. I'm down Get the for. hell out of here. With that. <laughs> that was the only time in his entire career he was at least interesting. You are I uh, well anyway your your barometer's off keep going uh manager of the year award uh I, and I I do want to say parenthetically here that I miss the era of WWE when there was like a dozen managers like all heel managers and like they all had stables uh I really like that cuz obviously I'm a Heenan guy but you know your nominees for this are Slick and Jimmy Hart and Mr. Fuji and obviously Bobby Heenan uh, and, and I liked all the like having people be in the families was always something I liked as a young wrestling fan. Uh, but the winner of this award is none of the above, Joe. None of them get it because they're all heels and like nobody gets an award. It's the bit. Get it? Well, listen, it was Gorilla doing his thing so he could interact with all the managers. And this actually lean for managers at this time in WWE. We just recently and when I say recently, like within months, probably lost luscious Johnny Valiant and the grant and the grand wizard. Um, so like the grand wizard was only managing like Sika and Kamala Kamala's gone. So Sika now gets co-opted over to um, Mr. Fuji luscious Johnny Valiant was managing Dino Bravo and Greg, the hammer Valentine as the new dream team. Dino Bravo is currently like nebulous right now. Valentine is back with Jimmy Hart and Frenchie Martin would debut. So this era of WWF, like it was minimally like five heel managers at all times. Yeah. And wait a minute. Fucking, oh, what's his face? Bam Bam Bigelow has, uh, Sir Oliver Humperdinck as his manager at this time. No Humperdinck on the show either. He was robbed of a payday, the poor guy. Yeah. It's always Humperdinck, Humperdinck, Humperdinck. 
Uh, Princess Bride. Anyways, right. uh, next up we have uh, Coco Beware performing the Pile Driver song. I did watch this. Uh, we have Bam Bam Bigelow definitely playing the sax, as I mentioned before. And the Ultimate Warrior just basically meandering around the stage carrying a sledgehammer, uh, ripping off Papa H. Uh, but Aww. I did... I did like the dancers in this one. Great costumes, great choreography, and time check. There was less than 20 minutes left, so things were picking up on the show. Uh, again, shocked to see them not lip-syncing here. Uh, the best part of this where we cut during the course of the song to a dream sequence of Coco Beware and Frankie out on a date, and he <laughs> gives a girl a rose. I don't know what the hell was going on, but I loved it. I love the the soft filter, you know how it was like framed with like a red heart, and uh, <laughs> it was very like cartoony. I, I did like that part, but yeah, I like this musical number. That might have been my favorite. Well, yeah, that was probably my favorite musical number. Uh, with, between the dancers and just the silliness of seeing the Ultimate Warrior walking around with the sledgehammer, but uh, yeah, I like that. Um, so next up we have the best hygiene award, uh, which is said to be the oldest and most coveted award in slammy history. And your nominees are Sika, Hillbilly Jim, George Steele, Nikolai Volkov, and Boris Zukov, and King Kong Bundy. And, uh, uh, Slick comes up. Well, basically, uh, Volkov and Zukov win. And they're accompanied by Slick, where he calls the crowd crackheads, and that Russians are clean and peaceful people. <laughs> Slick was the best. Slick is such an underrated manager. Like, when you have a time where it's like Bobby Heenan and Jimmy Hart are like full-fledged height of powers, like, Slick gets lost in the shuffle very easily. But, like, if you go back and watch Slick stuff during this era, especially, like, this is his first year in WWF, He's fantastic. Yeah, no, I agree. I like, like I said, I like the the wrestlers of maybe this around this era and a little bit later. I wasn't, you know, a Humperdinck and uh, Grand Wizard guy, but uh, before my time. But you know, this is the seeds of my favorite wrestling managers. And I'll say this: they did not do full musical performances. That's why I want this three hour cut of the Slammies. I I could only dream that they did an on stage live performance of Slick singing Jive Soul Bro, especially in that gold tux that he was wearing. All right, I, I take your word for it. Uh, when you find that three-hour cut, uh, yeah, don't let me know. All right. Next up, we have Girls in Cars being sang by Jimmy Hart. Uh, one of the dancers randomly in a bikini, the rest of them in, like, dresses. Uh, the dancers are distracted by Strike Force, who are on dirt bikes, which is the most 80s thing on the planet. Like, remember, like, every 80s movie, if you were cool, you rode a dirt bike? Yeah. Uh, like, in 2022, there's not a single adult on the planet that is cool that owns a dirt bike. Like, that's not a thing that exists anymore. Like, you get them for, like, little kids, you know, you like little mini bikes. But, like, if you're a full grown ass man in 2022 and you own a dirt bike, like, I'm sorry, you're not cool. But in the 80s, like, that's like your Johnny Lawrence era. That's the coolest thing on the planet. That's like having a horse in like the cowboy days. Right. But, We're like, and again, 31 year old Rick Martell, 30 whatever <laughs> year old Tito Santana coming out, not just on dirt bikes, Adam, on custom strike force dirt bikes. Yeah. Which, like I said, if they, like, they could, in 1987, if they just rode a dirt bike like near a beach, like every woman would be on them. But now, like, you, people would call the cops. Anyways, not a bad song. Uh, you know, but, but okay, so you forgot a very important bit of this. So the song is "Girls in Cars." Yeah. Now again, we're gonna wash out the fact that like Jimmy Hart sings the entrance theme for the hated rivals of the Hart Foundation. We're gonna wash that away, okay? Yeah. But um, girls in cars were on stage, so the girls are coming out on roller skates wearing like sandwich boards of cars and jimmy's trying to entice them all entice them all with his lovely singing the girls all fawn over strike force when they come out on their custom strike force dirt bikes but then there's the um <clears throat> larger woman who is wearing the sandwich board of a bus and she comes out and comes after jimmy hart throws jimmy over her shoulder and then makes off with him it was a different time joe haha <laughs> that's good shit pal yeah uh next up we have macho man and liz uh talking about the next award which is best vocal performance which <laughs> of course um 
junkyard dog and his growl, one man gang and his bellow, hacksaw, <laughs> hacksaw Jim Duggan, uh, in case you wanted more of him, and his ho, uh, Jimmy Hart's megaphone, and George the Animal Steals Whale. Uh, and wouldn't you know it, Jim Duggan wins the second award. Uh, and there's only five minutes left in the show. So Kevin pointed this out, that Jim Duggan was the first ever two-time Slammy Award winner. They should have brought him back to run a program with Owen back when Owen had two Slammys. Um, and again, like I said, you have your number two baby face essentially coming out and saying like, hey, this uh, Jim Duggan guy's pretty okay in my book, brother, uh-huh. Uh, the problem with Duggan uh, showing off being a two-time Slammy Award winner is they'd actually have to have two Slammys, which I'm 100% sure they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Again, WWE, WWE at, uh, hot off of their bi- like one of their biggest houses ever at WrestleMania 3. Hot off strong-arming the pay-per-view channels. They have such clout and stroke that they're able to get the cable companies to stop carrying Jim Crockett promotion pay-per-views. They're like, eh, we don't have enough money for more than one of these fake trophies. <laughs> yeah, like, how fucking expensive is a trophy? Like, we're not talking of, like, a seven-foot-tall, like... New Japan tournament trophy. We're talking something you go to the same place you get bowling trophies from. I don't know. Apparently, like, very expensive, I guess. I don't know what trophies cost in 1987. Ah, inflation. Uh, Next, we have our final song, which is If You Only Knew, which is a a rap, for lack of better terms, uh, that the entire roster is out there singing. And I wrote down once again, I hate this, and I I hope... (laughs) I hope Vince padded the lope for this, or were they forced to do it? That's a question I have. Like, did this, like, was there a bonus in everybody's, like, pockets for doing this show? Or was it just like, hey, you work here, this is part of your salary? Uh, I have a feeling this is you work here, and this is part of your quote-unquote salary. And this was the only song that was lip-synced. Okay. I mean, I heard a couple people's voices in there, but, you know... Anyways, uh, so next we have the presentation of the Song of the Year Award. So which one of these wonderful songs that we heard live uh, won the award? And all the heels grab the envelope and pass. They take a look at it and pass it along. And eventually Sika gets it and he eats it and then the show ends. So if you want to find out the results, you have to sift through Sika's poop because it's Vince McMahon. And poop's funny. <laughs> He's going to shit. I love it. <laughs> um, so everyone on social media, tell Adam how wrong he is that this was a lot of fun and Adam <sighs> hates fun. I love fun. This wasn't fun. Yeah. This had moments of of being fun, but it was very cringe. Like maybe if you grew up with it, but like seeing it for the first time. Oh, man, I just did not enjoy this. Wow. I didn't like it. I'm sorry. That this sounds like an Adam problem is all I'm saying. I don't know. I don't know if you. I don't want to encourage anybody to go watch this, but if anybody didn't watch it and then you know, just based on our description, if somebody agrees with me, let me know. I'm sure you're out there. If you're not a sicko fan, Joe, yes man, you might. <laughs> oh my god, you might agree with me on that. But uh, Joe, I'm going to assign your homework now. All right, I'm sure it's going to be something equally as good as the 1987 Slammys or better. Well, it's going to be a lot newer. I can say that. Um, Okay. Although, like, in my mind, when you tell me 1987, I feel like that's only 22 years ago, even though it's much, much older. But I am going to assign you something from 22 years ago. Oh. And uh, this is kind of uh, fitting with the theme of some recent homeworks. And also, I I might have Googled uh, show me uh, movies with wrestlers in it, but we're going to start things off with a bang, and we're going to watch the ni- the 2000 classic Ready to Rumble. Oh, God. <laughs> that's a walk in the park. I didn't imply that it wouldn't be. Like I again, I'm I'm not going to work myself into a shoot. I'm not going to sign bad things like the 1987 Slammies. Uh, we're going to watch it. I I have not seen it since it was in theaters. 
I did go to see it in theaters, and we'll maybe talk about that next week. Um, I know it is not available on any free streaming things, so uh, you know wherever Christmas Bounty was, we'll have to provide this as well. Um, but yeah, this will be my first time watching it in 22 years. Um, it says that it's on stars. If you have stars, yeah, which I don't, so I'll have okay. to. I'll have to acquire it through completely legal means. Mm-hmm. Me too. Now I'm surprised that this isn't just on YouTube. Not that anyone would want to, would want to claim this. <laughs> it's on like a pay YouTube, which I don't know what that is. No, I don't go in for no pay YouTubes. Nah. But uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I know we've been watching a lot of WCW that kind of bounced around that era. You know. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll be watching. We'll be watching uh, Ready to Rumble. You know. Yep. And it's I'm, funny, Joe, like when you Google, there's a lot of movies that star wrestlers. It's interesting. I'm just it's uh-huh. food for thought, food for thought. Okay. About lots of movies out there. Well, listen, I already have my uh, my whatever plan for next year. Yeah, <laughs> this is like a long box Patreon stuff. We we have like might have a bit for the year. I got a bit for the year. Uh, I might as well. OK. Uh, I'm gonna grab the smallest, most people grabbing it. Okay, <laughs> I'm not Gra- doing any. I'm buying- not doing it. Listen, don't don't pay attention they- to what's going on over here. Okay, <laughs> you're buying a physical copy on Amazon. I see. That's what I'm doing. Yes, I'm signing up for stars. <laughs> as <laughs> as speak. speak. All right. So uh, I guess Adam has some things to announce this week. Is that correct? Uh, as long as you hit the jingle. Neutral Monarch of At Odds Wrestling. I just want to say right off the rip, like the gender neutral monarch jingle might be like tied with the hundred dollar Vansky jingle as my favorites. <laughs> and like I don't want to like have that be a knock on DeWiki because obviously. Like he does does the voice on there, spoiler. But like it's music from Transformers the movie, which is probably why I like it a lot because it gets me nostalgic. But anyways, uh, kudos to Wiki. Um, so yes, the fourth annual ish gender neutral monarch tournament is about to start. And just to recap for folks who did not listen last week, shame on you. We announced previously the eight of the first competitors, and uh, just to once again. The champion of We Need Wrestling, Max the Impaler. Final Wrestling Place, nominated Mandy Rose. Pod Van Dam, rest in peace, uh, <laughs> nominated Alabama Doink. Wrestling Cheers, nominated Isaiah Broner. Indie Wrestling Guide, nominated Derek Dillinger. Hit My Music, nominated Jaden Newman. Joe, you wasted your pick on Jeff Jarrett. <laughs> Uh, and obviously, it would not be a gender neutral monarch tournament if we did not have the boar on there. Oh, you say you said you said his name, so I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like saying it like if you say it three times as he show up. Or I wish he did. <laughs> um, all right, I, 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 let's stop that crap. <laughs> <laughs> um, Go ahead. So obviously, there are eight names remaining, so I am happy to make an announcement of. Some of those competitors <laughs> joining the previously mentioned eight people are CPA. Hey, I know him. Yeah, it, it, it just goes to show if you like a bunch of my tweets, you get in the gender neutral monarch. <laughs> <laughs> also, new to the tournament and an interesting development depending on where they end up in the bracket. Ziggy Heim. Okay. Ziggy wasn't in it before? Uh, she was not. I checked multiple times. Okay. If that, listen, this is your deal, so I'm just... Yep. Uh, yeah, and again, we'll get to that when we get to it. Uh, all of these people are have been vetted as not having appeared before. Okay. Uh, we use the same Academy of Science and, and Sports uh, as the WWE Slammies. <laughs> 
Uh, so Jim also, Duggan's going to win twice. It's it, he's he is technically eligible. He's never been in it before. <laughs> he's just as relevant as Jeff Jarrett. Um, anyways, also in the gender neutral monarch tournament, giving a little representation locally for us, Rex Lawless. Okay. Uh, looks like a billion dollars. We're going to put him in this tournament. Uh, a lot of other LVAC people have been in it before, but Rex has not been. A- Avery Good was swooning over Rex Lawless this past uh, Friday on commentary. I mean, that's justified. I mean, pff, Jesus Christ. Uh, also, speaking of LVAC and uh, pretty much any r- reputable indie around the country, world famous CB Cheeseburger is Ooh. in the general neutral monarch tournament. That's a tough pick. Yep. Uh, next up, somebody who's in, we, we may have mentioned already on the show, surprisingly has not been in the tournament before, Mr. Maserati Wes Barkley. Oh, the, the man who's going to uh, steal the show at Brodsky's uh, New Year's Eve party this weekend. Yep, yep. And the sixth person that I'm going to name this week, and Joe, I, I pulled up the brackets. I checked the list three times, not four times, not five times. I checked, and I was shocked that this person has not been in the Gender Neutral Monarch Tournament. And that is the face of women's wrestling, Tay Mello. The face? The face has never been in the tournament, and that's a glaring oversight for me. For you, for sure. (laughs) That's a glaring oversight. So here's the thing, Joe. This is a 16-person tournament. Uh, obviously we had eight names last week. I just named six. That leaves two blank spots. And no, I'm not going to let you nominate Jeff Jarrett two more times, but I would like to hear from you, not you, Joe, the other people listening to this podcast, who do you want to see in the gender neutral monarch tournament? Uh, do you, a listener want to be in the tournament? Are you a wrestler and you want to be in there? Tweet it out, tweet the show, tag the show, whatever. I'm not saying that I'm going to pick what you say, but I'd like to hear your input. Like, obviously, I reached out to our podcasting friends, but there's a lot of listeners uh, who might want to have their voices known. And then next week, not only will I announce my final decision on those last two picks, but I will announce the brackets and we will start the voting the very next day of the first round. So you're putting this in the listeners' hands, possibly, right? I want to hear what they have to say. If they give me something good, like if somebody said to me last week that Tay Conti, Tay Mello was never in the tournament, I would have been shocked and I would have immediately put them in. But obviously I discovered that on my own. But maybe there's something else, somebody that's on Joe and and my radar that like I just haven't included yet. Uh, by all means, let me know. Like I said, if you're a wrestler and you're listening, let me know if you want to be in it. And I'll put it into consideration. Uh, make sure maybe you, you you go to shake my hand. Maybe there's a 20 in there. We'll see what happens. Uh, but, yeah, I'd like to hear from you guys if there's somebody that uh, you'd like to see in the tournament this year. Uh, but, yeah, next week will be the final brackets, and then we'll start the voting. And I'm, listen, I'm just going to throw it out there for the listeners. Adam likes to accuse you all of being sycophants for me. (laughs) And if you want to prove Adam right, he's just recently come off, you know, a a recent uh, surgery scare. Um, You know, we won't hold this against him, but he was on Tucker Carlson talking about how he thwarted a home invasion at his house. Um, He's been mentioned several times on this episode this week. Tell Adam you want Hacksaw Jim Duggan in the tournament. I mean, they can tell me anything they want. It doesn't mean he's getting in. <laughs> All right. I'm just saying if there's an overwhelm, an overwhelming groundswell support for Hacksaw Jim Duggan to go into the tournament and you deny that from happening, uh, then that's on you, Adam. I'll just put him up against Jeff Jarrett in the first round. That way it's like one of them will get squashed out. <laughs> Again, better to get it out in the first round because it definitely would be the finals if they were separate. I understand. <laughs> Why do you have to try to ruin everything that I like, Joe? (laughs) I don't try to ruin everything that you like. I just like to put a little good in the bad that you do. Uh, I don't I don't agree with any of that. But uh, but yeah. So, again, tweet at me, tweet at the show. uh, Let your voices be heard uh, or at least considered. 
Right. Tweet at Adam. Tweet at the show account. Please don't tweet at me with any of this. No, tag him. Tag him on everything. I want I want Joe's notifications going off nonstop. I will untag myself if you tag me and stuff for this. You can untag yourself? You absolutely can. I didn't know. Do you need to come to my Twitter class? I might. I just learned about bookmarking tweets like a couple months ago. Listen, I just saw The Wizard of Oz for the first time the other day, (laughs) so I understand. Yeah. Hey, let's get in some phone calls. All right. Hello, gentlemen. Kevin here. So is tonight a PVD memory? Is that what's going on, according to Twitter? Um. I didn't call into PVD for the last one because I did call in twice before and was greatly misunderstood and didn't even know who I was really. And <laughs> it was before I got talking to Ed as much online as I do now. So I was just too embarrassed and all. But, you know, thank you, Joe, and soon be named network for introducing me to Pod Van Dam and all the enjoyment oh. I've had. They only upset me once. There was one Dwight call. Um, I, I, can't remember all the details, but there was one that just uh, absolutely hit some of my triggers, and I said, it's not funny anymore. I, I'm not going to listen to this anymore. Oh my and I did listen for a little while, and then came back to it, and I thoroughly enjoyed it since. There's just one one episode, one clip, which was a little too much for me in the moment. Um, everyone has their things, you know. But I'm going to miss Pod Van Dam. We'll free up a little bit of time for listening to other podcasts, like the fine ones for the soon-to-be-named network. And uh, I hope that uh, maybe eventually Ed has his own show on the network and I can hear his delightful, wonderful, sweet voice once again. Um, so I'll call back with a stupid question next week. See you later, guys. Um, yeah, so obviously, if uh, you are unaware, Pod Van Dam dropped their final episode, their final original episode, because they'll do a, a Dwight recap, allegedly. Um, but yeah, I also... Uh, did not get a phone call in, but I got one in, but it wasn't on time. Uh, because Joe, I, I was listening to the card is going to change yesterday morning or afternoon. And in that Ronald two legs is like, Oh yeah, we're recording pod Van Dam tonight. And I didn't realize that the card is going to change was a day old at that time. So I was like, I got home and I was like, okay, I'm going to call into pod Van Dam, get all my bits in, you know, <laughs> and uh, one last time. And then after I sent the call for whatever reason, I got second, like not second thoughts, but I was like, did, did they record yet? And I asked you and you're like, yeah, that was last night. And I felt really bad because I wanted to get a call in. But I did try to negotiate with Jonas to get the unused calls, but he has me blocked. Oh, he does? I'm kidding. No, he just say he does. He was like, nah, it's good. I don't want to be associated with that. Odds. <laughs> I was going to say, because if Jonah had you blocked, that sounds like some snowflake cock behavior out of him. <laughs> He'll, ne- he'll never know because he doesn't listen to this podcast. He doesn't, but allegedly Ronald Two Legs is a new re-listener. Like he's I know, back. very nice. That's... I can't say anything bad about Pat anymore, like I've been for the last 221 <laughs> episodes. Yeah, as long as he doesn't go back and listen to those, we'll be, we'll be fine. But uh, yeah, so that that's awesome. But yeah, uh, sad to see Pod Van Dam go. I understand why, but... I, I learned so much from Pod Van Dam as far as what's going on on wrestling Twitter because I don't. Luckily for me, I don't follow a lot of those circles. Yeah. Uh, so like, I learn a lot of the the stuff that's going on. Um, I like to hear how the young kids talk. You know, all those young whippersnappers on Pod Van Dam. I think they're uh, all in their late thirties, early forties. Adam. I, well, no, shh, that's kayfabe. You don't you don't know about that. But uh, you know, good luck to all of them. Uh, I did say on my call that nobody will ever hear. I was trying to make one last impassioned plea to get Dwight to call us, but Mm. uh, yeah, maybe that's not that 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 didn't age well. Uh, Go listen to the episode to find out. Uh, But yeah, good luck to all those guys. Uh, Good luck to Ed joining the soon to be named network uh, and cutting me in on all of his profits. And uh, yeah. Yep, the young the young Ed podcast sounds good coming in 2023 to the soon to be named network. Absolutely, I'm uh, sure and I have this first guest, and I have a feeling we're going to have a lot more people coming here this week, at least, and possibly in the future, uh, to talk about Pod Van Dam and their memories of such since they all forgot to call in. Um, it's not like they regularly change their recording schedule week to week. Yeah, but I mean, it would have helped if Ed wasn't in Twitter jail, and maybe uh, there's some more tweeting about it. 
that that is true. That is true. Um, you know, Pat doesn't have a Twitter. Ed's in Twitter jail. Uh, Jonas only tweets uh, his Infowars stuff. <laughs> and uh, TSJ actually just recently had an incident where his cat had to go to the vet. So yeah, uh, go check out his stuff and uh, go help him out. Help his, uh, you know, his little kitty out. Yeah. But it was a really good last episode. Go listen to it. Yep. Next call. Hello, Joe. Hello, Adam. It's Justin Summers. I know you can tell by how great the sound quality is. <laughs> but my question for you guys this week is, are there any meet and greets or mark photos of any non-wrestlers or people that aren't in the wrestling business that you would like to cross off your bucket list? This conversation came up after my wife and I were on our way home from Steel City Con. And it was at this Still City Con that my wife got to meet Charlie Hunnam, a.k.a. Jax Teller, from Sons of Anarchy. And I didn't meet anybody that day. It was all, it was all for her. But we kind of got in a conversation of you no know, other celebrities we would like to meet. And I thought about me, and I'm like, I've met who I want to meet. Either that or it is highly unlikely I'm ever going to see some of the few people at a Comic-Con. Or any type of meet and greet situation. Or if I was going to, it would be really expensive. You know, the other option is they're they're dead. Like I think of like all the things that are that mean a lot to me. Artists, actors, whatever it might be. Like the ones that are the closest. I love Chris Farley. He's dead. I love ICP. I've met him three times. Sublime is another one of my favorite bands. And I love to meet, you know, Bradley Knoll. He's dead. Love Johnny Cash. He's dead. My favorite football player of all time is Brian Urlacher. Okay, that's oh. somewhat doable. <laughs> but over the past few years, I've uh, kind of just liked the player, not so much the person attached to the playing. I like Doctor Who, and I've met my favorite Doctor and Companion, you know, the 11th Doctor and Amy Pond, a.k.a. Matt Smith, Karen Gillian. One of my examples of somebody who would probably just be way too expensive or never would happen is one of the more recent artists that I'm a huge fan of. But I, for obvious reasons, I don't like, you know, go out, buy all the merch. I'll buy the music and that's it. But that's uh, Billie Eilish. And I think uh, a current 36 year old, almost 37 year old meeting a now 21 year old. Um, I don't know. She's literally like a month older than my niece. So not not sure how I feel about that one. But well, that that would Taylor probably Swift. be like the closest thing I have of somebody that I like enough or even, you know, kiss. But it would have to be the all four original members. So I'm curious to, you know, who's on your guys list? Do you, do you even have a list? Like this is me just like trying to think of people. But like I said, at the same time, it, it, I don't have a lot left. Can't wait to hear what uh, you guys have. And I'll talk to you guys next week. Later. Um, this is a good a good question, Summers. Could have been said in half the time, but good question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you, mentioned, you mentioned Matt Smith and Karen Gillen. Those are actually two people that I do have Mark photos with already. Um, so uh, that immediately sprung to mind that I speaking of the doctor and a companion, I'd love to have a Mark photo with David Tennant. And with uh, Jenna Coleman, and uh, Jenna Coleman would be a very special meet and greet that I definitely behave myself for. Um, I, I do have regrets. Poor Jenna. Yeah, poor Jenna. Uh, I do have regrets that, like back in the day, going to comic cons, like especially when he was more like coherent and wasn't being propped up. But like, I should have got a picture with uh, Stan Lee. Ah, uh, uh, yes. You know, like he, obviously the last couple of years, like the people that were handling him were just like weekend at Bernie's thing. Um, uh, so like I would have loved it like at least back in like the mall rats era, like 20 years ago when he was Stan Lee, you know? Um, and I guess like from sports, like, yeah, I, I can easily, I can be like, Oh, Ben Roethlisberger, TJ Watt or whatever. But I, I, it always, always comes back to my boy, Nick Swisher. I almost went to a, a free meet and greet photo op that he was going to have in like suburban New York. And it was at like an AT&T store where he's like doing a spokesperson job. And then COVID hit. 
and then there's never been like a make good on it or anything like that. So I'm kind of bummed. But yeah, Swisher's probably my my sports person and uh, Tennant and Coleman. So, uh, you know, obviously with my involvement with wrestling, um, I was, you know, obviously they talk about it on uh, Hawkins and Broski podcast, how there was a period of time where it was like kind of gauche when you're like in wrestling to get marked pictures with other wrestlers that are like at a higher level than you are, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's like it wasn't cool. Then. Right, and things have kind of changed a bit. Um, I did get my mark picture with Terry Funk when he came into AIW. I still kick myself to this day that I never got my mark picture with Double J, and it was one of those things where he got to the building late. He came out, he did his opening spot, I was doing commentary for the whole show, he did the meet and greet at intermission, and then he was gone. And I just never got a chance to. And I kick myself for that one. So I want Double J, and I'd love to get Mick Foley. Like, those are like my two favorite guys, right, wrestling-wise, okay? Yeah, well, not wrestling. Well, that would think right, that so not wrestling. I'm a big comic book guy. And going to the comic book things, I'm not somebody who will buy, like, the signature stuff off people. I love getting Mark pictures with creators. Mm-hmm. You know, you mentioned Stan Lee and like, you know, whatever Stan Lee, they were charging an arm and a leg even when I was going to conventions. I haven't been to a convention in a very long time, but there's a lot of like the new up and coming crew of comic book people um, that I'm a fan of. Like your Jason Aaron's, uh, your Donny Cates, your Tom Taylor's, your Kyle Starks, your people like that, that I'd love to get Mark pictures with. Yeah. Um, and those are like easily attainable, but it's just a situation of like, I've got to get my ass to a convention, right? Yeah. Like, I have somewhere, like, I don't even think I have them digitally. Like, I have four by six printouts from, like, Wizard World Chicago in 2000 that I went to. And, like, I have me and Joe Casada, me and Steve Dillon, Garth Ennis. Uh, yeah, Jim that's Palmiotti, really cool. You know, like, somewhere. Uh, I think it's actually me getting a picture with Ennis and, like, Steve Dillon is, like, photobombing it, which is oh, awesome. Oh, that's hilarious. Uh, but I, I got to see if I can find those and scan them, you know? Yeah, I have a t- – like, from – one of the, like, when we went to Baltimore – like had to be like 11 years ago, I got like a ton of people. Like I got Mark Wade, I got Tony Harris, I got, you know, uh, I got uh, 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 Gail Simone, Jimmy Palmiotti, Amanda Connor, like tons of people that I love. So like I said, those are like my people that I can have access to. But if there was one, like a big one out there, okay, mm-hmm. has to be very specific, okay? It has to, it, it, it would be uh, Anthony Starr. Okay. Okay. Yeah. He would have to be in the full Homelander regalia. Yeah. And we would both have to be holding a glass of milk. (laughs) Yeah. I've talked to Todd about that. Like, uh, there, whenever there's cons, and especially if they're relatively local, Todd will ask me if I want to go and I'll look at the guest list. And uh, some people that, like, me and him agree, like, our instant goes is uh, Homelander. And uh, the guy who plays uh, Captain Pike on the new Star Trek show. Uh, there were big marks for both of them. So I can see that. Uh, and I will just say wrestling related, even though Summers said not wrestling, but you cheated. Um, I missed my opportunity this past week at LVAC. I really wanted to get a mark photo with Ian Riccoboni. But, like, I had planned on doing it after the show, and uh, I I told you privately, like, I got a text message during the main event that flustered me, and I thought we might have had to have left in a hurry. Uh, Everything was a false alarm, but, like, during the time when, like, Ian was meandering around and glad-handing with people, uh, just being super cool, uh, like, I was just thinking, like, oh, crap, like, I gotta get out of here. So, like, next time there's an LVAC show, I'm gonna go look for Ian. I I got a mark picture with Ian Riccoboni. Well, you know Ian, I don't. All Ian might remember about me is that I bought his micro bra recently. <laughs> there you go. But next that's time. more than I did for him. <laughs> All right. Next All right. Call. Thank you for your call. Next call. Hey, Joe and Adam, what's happening? Uh, it's your buddy Kenny. Hope all's well. Want to wish you both happy New Year. Uh, hope I'm getting this in uh, under the wire. Uh, you know, pretty crazy week and things are uh, happening. Uh, send off of Todd Van Dam. Uh, pretty crazy. The end of an era. None of this uh, weird, you know, Triple H, uh, Undertaker, you know, Shawn Michael stuff. Who cares? I'm worried about Pat and Ed and Jonas and Jobber, I guess. What are they going to do? Worried, whatever. 
But uh also want to thank Adam for the uh, photographic evidence of the uh, last LVAC show, the holiday hangout that I was unable to make. But it uh, looks like a good time was had by all. I'm looking forward to the recap of that. And uh, speaking of the LVAC, a friend of mine uh, runs a cool website called thepopbreak.com and asked a crew of people about their favorite match of the year. And while everybody's talking about WWE this and AEW, you that my personal favorite match happened in a little in the little town of Bethlehem where Big Dan took on Max the Impaler and you can read all about it uh, at the Twitters I'll tweet it out share it with everybody and all that good stuff so anyways happy new year to you both uh, may Godo beat the crap out of FTR uh, on the way to winning the IWGP championships in January because Wrestle Kingdom is go-to season, baby. Get wrecked, Box. <laughs> uh, Kenny, thank you for seeing my pictures and liking them and not taking them and posting them as if they're your own without crediting me. <laughs> Uh, you need to start watermarking your stuff. I, I do. I do. Lots of my stuff getting stolen lately. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. But, yeah, I missed you there, Kenny. I was hoping to see you. Uh, unfortunately, I was just stuck hanging out with Kyle. But uh, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I think Ken, I think Kenny said that he had a gig that day, too. That's yeah, why he missed yeah, it. Yeah, that's true. But, uh, all right, so I take back the coward thing. Uh, maybe get your priorities straight, though. Like, man, S- gig, see, wrestling. What Kenny needs to do is he needs to contact the people in charge of the LVAC uh, Athletic Sports and Circumstances, whatever the fuck it stands for, <laughs> yeah. and uh, get your band to play at an LVAC show. Oh, there you go. Two birds, one stone. See? Now you have no excuse. You'll be at your gig and at the LVAC show. I like it. I like it. Good idea. All right, next call. Hopefully I'm not in too late. This is the other JB here. Uh, I'm going to be on my best behavior after uh, my last uh, phone call went off the rails. So for uh, one of my presents was uh, kind of here was the uh, John Moxley autobiography. I've uh, gotten a little bit into it. Uh, pretty good. I uh, was just curious about if there were any other um, major um, autobiographies or biographies that you know any of y'all um, have read or would highly recommend. Already, thank you. All right, you thank you, other, thank you, other JB, for giving us a call. Uh, again, highly irregular, last minute in, uh, inclusion here in the show. <laughs> um. Yeah, I, I I feel bad. I have the Mox book, and I feel like I got a quarter of the way into it, and I got distracted. And I never went back to it. It's really good. Uh, that's one yeah, of the ones I where like I got it. the the book on tape version of it. You know, because it's essentially like Mox cutting a promo the whole time. You know. Yeah. Um. Obviously, I think the easy answer, uh, and I'm sure you would second it, is like Foley's first two books. Yeah, so, like, do we live in a world where there's wrestling fans that haven't read those books? It's quite possible, because, like, back then, I mean, Foley was probably the first of, like, the uh, like the Attitude Era people, but, like, eventually everybody got a book, but they all sucked, because they That's were all, true. like, ghostwritten and, like, written in character. Like, The Rocks is an absolute train wreck of a book, because, like, when he joins the WWE, he starts writing it, and, like, uh, and then The Rock did this, and The Rock did that. But, yeah, like, there's probably people out there that never read Have a Nice Day or Foley as Good, and those mm-hmm. are, like, the blueprint for, like, a wrestling autobiography. Yeah, so, Jer- uh, so yeah, the two Foley ones are good. The first Jericho one is good. Yeah, like a lion's tail. Yeah, uh, the flare one is good with an asterisk, and I say that in um, a lot of it is kind of fancied up a little bit. It was like co-written by Mark Madden back when Ric Flair and Mark Madden were still friends. What a pair of those two. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. So again, you know, your mileage may vary with the way some of those stories come out, but any time that they put into a book um, that him and Roddy Piper wrestled in like cuba caused a riot and were paid with a spittoon of cocaine i'm like all right that's a good enough of a visual that i could forgive all the other bullshit that's in this book you know whether that story is true or not either you know yeah 
Um, where a lot of it runs into, like Adam said, is that so many of them are like, in, like Arn Anderson's book is 100% in character and it stinks because of it, you know? Yep. And we'll never get um, an on the level Arn Anderson book, which is a shame. Um, there is a Vince Russo book, okay? I think it's called Forgiven and it's like how the wrestling business killed Vince Russo. Um, if you are a sick individual, <laughs> you should read that. Um, I know on Pod Van Dam, uh, Brian read the real Kane Glenn Jacobs biography. I say you have to read My Path Through Hell or whatever it is, the one <laughs> where it's Kane's story as uh. though it's Kane the character writing a novelization about his life. <laughs> Where it's specifically citing moments that happened during the Attitude Era, and they're, like, writing chapters to fill in the gaps between the weeks of TV. Um, it's a fascinating read, if if anything. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'll take your word on that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's always I, called I, My Journey into Darkness. My apologies. And I will say, just as a full, a full transparency, and probably the only bad thing I'll ever say about the greatest wrestler alive, Shawn Michaels, oh. is he has two books, and they're both trash. The first one is very much like a WWE-produced book, where it's like all, you know, in kayfabe. And then the other one's all like, you know, God stuff, which I, I hated as well. But, uh, uh, yeah, so poor Shawn Michaels. But, yeah, like, if for some reason you, like other J, uh, JB, like... If you haven't read those Foley books, like, that's the beginning and end of, like, autobiographies. Go look for those. Mr. Hitman's book, okay? Uh, I'm sure that's... So, Mr. Hit Mr. Hitman's book is dense, okay? Okay, yeah. If, if you like day-to-day -day minutia from 1991 to 2000, then of everything that happened in Brett's career, then that's the book for you. That that just sounds great, like Bret Hart, like a detail of like what he had for breakfast. Like that sounds like something I'm gonna run out and get. <laughs> well, okay, so it's not that, but it's I like know, but, he, well, what he, he did. kept an audio journal, like he had like a little mini tape recorder that he would record like everything that he was doing on the road. You know, like uh, it's so. painfully uh, honest, like when he gets into like his infidelity with his wife and stuff. But like gotcha. it's very truthful. And, like, to have that sort of access and, you know, just ma very matter-of-factly of, like, this is what happened, this is what was going on, and this is what I saw, and this is the towns, and everything else like that. Like I said, it's very dense, it's very dry, but if you're a fan of Mr. Hitman, you'll enjoy it. All right, cool. All right, it's pink button time. Yay! Ed called a bunch of times. Yay! Hey, Joe and Adam, it's Ed. Uh, hopefully you can hear me because I'm calling from a different spot than I normally do. Um, so, I'm still in Twitter jail, but I am the entire time allowed to scroll it and, like, read through it. I just can't interact with anybody. And I saw um, somebody tweet um, that said, everyone's allowed to believe in one conspiracy theory is a little treat. And um, I think you're allowed more than one, right? If it's, I think you're allowed one big one, and then like other non-consequential ones that like don't like mean anything to anybody, right? Um, so like my one big one is like we didn't land on no fucking moon. That's insane. We didn't even have like microwaves or internet, but we built a a tube that flew to a rock in the sky. It doesn't make any sense. It makes way more sense that we just fake that shit. Um, that's my one big one. All right. But I have these two other ones. And one, uh, Adam, it's a sports one. So I think you'll like this. Um, Paul Pierce for sure shit his pants in the 2007 NBA Finals. That's 100% what happened. That man shit his pants and, was, and made him take him out in a wheelchair because he accidentally shit his pants on uh, in the NBA Finals. And then the second one is the Bucks for sure kicked that fucking 
door in the CM Punk's dog's face. The only thing that makes sense. <laughs> the only thing that makes sense why he, he would react that violently and weirdly is they kicked that fucking door into his dog. Or right? Phil's a crazy person. <laughs> no one can convince me that that didn't happen. And I know I'm in the very small minority here, but like, they kicked that fucking door in that dog's face. Um, five against Ted. Bye. Ah, <laughs> <sighs> Ed. <laughs> I don't know, Joe. Do you have a conspiracy theory? I guess was the question that you want to believe, or you're allowed to believe. So I, I think every conspiracy theory, there's like a grain of truth that kind of starts it and kind of builds it from there. You know. Okay. Um, Ed mentions that the moon landing never happened. Um, there's rumors that Stanley Kubrick filmed the moon landing. <laughs> uh, but as I understand it, because of th- he wanted such realism for it, they went to the moon and filmed it there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a joke, ladies and gentlemen. I <laughs> will say so. And again, conspiracy theories. Like, I definitely think there's other life out there. Do I think an alien crashed in Roswell and they're keeping it captive at Area 51? No. But are there other, is there other life out there in the solar system? Yes. But not in the way that we're all led to believe that it's out there, right? Uh-huh. Um, but if I was... So the one if I believe... So there's rumor... You know, it, and these are wrestling ones, right? That mm. Hall and Nash were sent to WCW by Vince McMahon to kill WCW for real from the, from the inside. Okay. Now, while I don't think that is true, what I do think is true is that Vince McMahon saw that Vince Russo was out of ideas and didn't care so much that he quit WWF because he knew that would help kill WCW that much quicker. Okay, I can see that. That makes that actually makes sense somewhat, you know. Right. So that's like the one that I kind of sort of believe, you know. Gotcha. And then um, with the Bucks and Punk and everything else like that. So what I think happened was the Bucks forcefully opened the door. Okay, and when I say forcefully, they may have thought the door was locked, so ga- they gave it like a little extra shove, and mm-hmm. the door may the door may have came very close to Larry. No offense. Larry looks like he's a fucking mess. The dog looks like he would break break his teeth chewing his alpo. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And are you mean to tell me that the Bucks kicked the door and it caused it to open with such fervor that it did damage to like an eight pound dog? The Bucks shit looks like it couldn't crack an egg. Who are we kidding here? <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm always going back and forth on that because it's like I, I I like CM Punk, but at the same time he's a big fucking liar. So true. Uh, yeah, I don't have any conspiracy theories other than the fact that the NFL for 20 years rigged it so that Tom Brady could be successful. But other than that, uh, no conspiracies. I will say that 2000, the 2002 Super Bowl, um, was absolutely rigged at post 9-11 so that the Patriots would win the Super Bowl to help bolster like American patriotism, rah, rah, whatever, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one of the propaganda department, you know? Yeah. All right. Cool. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. Ed has another call. Oh yeah. I'm calling back because I have more to say and I don't have an outlet anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So also, um, I started watching, 2002 NASCAR races on YouTube, and wow. um, I forgot how much I loved NASCAR from like 2001 to like 2005, and I think I only quit watching it because Dale Earnhardt Jr. stopped driving that like Budweiser car. <laughs> and I just wondered, is there like anything that you guys like loved a lot that you just at one point you're like, this is clown shoes and I can't do this anymore? Uh, besides Pod Van Dam. <laughs> uh, because yeah, I watched like three NASCAR races from 2002, and I'm like, shit was really good. It was really good. <laughs> I don't know. Is this nostalgia? It's not, I can't believe people get obsessed with this because it doesn't. It makes your brain do very happy thoughts, and it's it's good stuff. I get it. I understand you now, Johnny Gargano. I understand why you're stuck in 1996. It's just better. <laughs> 
Okay, bye. Ah. Uh, what was the question? Uh, so is there like a nostalgia thing that like maybe you watched and then like you look back on like, oh, that was horrible. Why did I spend so much of my time watching that? Ah, uh, all right. I don't know. You go first. So I wouldn't say that it's horrible, but it was definitely one of those things where I saw the decline and it was a very st- like it wasn't a gradual decline. It was a very steep decline. And that is uh, the YouTube series Angry Video Game Nerd. Okay. Are you aware of this? Do you know this man? I, I, I You know what? I can tell you that uh, when he first came out, like his first like 10 episodes or so, I watched them all and I liked them. Yeah. And then I never gave him a second thought for 20 years. Okay. And then like a couple months ago, I just all of a sudden decided like I'm going to watch a lot of stuff on YouTube. And I actually watched every episode from start to finish. Wow. Okay. Uh, and I'm not going to say I like I liked I liked some of them and parts of them. I can I, I I know where you're going with this, and I can see that like you know whatever. But I I have just recently like binged all of them. Okay, uh, but yeah, it was just like so I I really liked them. It was something that me and my brother would always like whatever the new videos would come up. We'd always message each other and like if we were together, we'd like oh I'm going to see you later today. So let's watch it. We can watch it together. You know. It was yeah. kind of like appointment viewing whenever a new one would come out. And then he took some time off to make the movie and he was doing a lot of other stuff with it as well. And I liked all the other ancillary stuff. And then me and my brother went to like Philly or something to go see the movie. And the movie is really bad. Oh, like, really? I, I didn't see the movie. I, I mean, I can imagine. Yeah. You know? But like even then I'm like, OK, well, the movie was bad. But like, hey, you tried, you know, like not everyone sure. can make a movie. It's tough. Right. Yeah. What when you're a guy who makes like 20 minute videos on the YouTube and you're gonna make like an, uh, a two hour plus long narrative, right? Yeah. So then it was shortly after that where like they introduced like a whole bunch of like new characters and stuff. Now I didn't know what was going on at the time, but it definitely felt like a very sharp tonal shift in the way the videos were being produced and who was involved and like. I'm just like, oh, well, like, he always had his friends on, and these are just, like, his other friends that he's now having in the videos. But, like, years later, I would find out, both directly and indirectly, that he had hired a company to help him produce the videos, and these were the guys that worked for that production company. So they just kind of, like, shoehorned themselves into the whole angry video game nerd universe. Okay. Yeah. Is there, so, is there somebody like as an example? Because I'm not. I don't know. Like I know the characters of like. Oh, here's Bugs Bunny, and here's okay, you know, whatever. But I'm trying to think of like who you mean that the production company stuck in. Okay. Um. The, it would be more recent episodes from like let's say the last five to six years. Um, fat guys and fat bearded guys. I mean, just general people, like not a there's, specific. There's w- okay. There's one guy who's a big, a big giant fat guy named Justin. There's another fat bearded guy whose name I forget, and there's another fat bearded guy whose name is Tony. Okay, you know what? I I think like there's times when I'm watching it. If if he's doing a little bit, maybe I fast forward through it. So that might be what it is. Okay, like I just watch the video games being played. So when it when you can tell like okay, he just beat the game finally, and you look and there's ten minutes left to the video, and it's not going to be another game. It's just him doing a skit. I'm like, okay, I'm done with this video. So that might be what it is. Now, did you watch any of the other ancillary ones where we do like non-video game stuff like movies and TVs and stuff like that? Or you just watch the video game ones? If if it's not uh, angry Nintendo or video game nerd, I I skip them. Okay. So they kind of are featured a lot more in those. But they they are also the actors in the bits alongside the video game ones. So if you're only watching the video game stuff and not the bits... Yeah, then you're probably missing these guys. Okay, that's why I was so confused there. But uh, and I will say just for mine, really quick, this actually came up with uh, a buddy of mine a couple days ago. Um, we used to and again. This is also t- maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Like we were obsessed with, along with the, a lot of the country, we're obsessed with watching poker on TV. Yeah, like, the World, the World of Series poker. of Poker. Yeah, on on ESPN. 
Uh, and it was like, I used to be able to like name like the world series of poker champions starting with moneymaker on through like the next 10 people. And it was like, okay, the tournament is starting this day. ESPN's coverage is starting this day. You know, I want to watch the main event and like all of like Norman Chad's commentary. And then I'm like, I haven't watched poker on TV in like six, seven years. And like, is it even on TV anymore? And I found out it's on like CBS sports or some shit. And it was just interesting how it was something that I would spend 20, 30, 40 hours a year watching during the world series. And now I don't you know, I don't give a shit. I would only watch the celebrity version. Okay. Cause I like seeing the celebrities in there specifically. I like seeing Jennifer Tilly in there gambling away all of Sam Simon's money. <laughs> well, Jennifer Tilly became a professional player, so like she's right. now just considered a professional poker pro. Right. Yeah. But this was and the I beginning like, when like, she was just a celebrity who was in the celebrity version of those things, gambling yeah. away all of Sam Simon's money. Now that Sam Simon's dead, it is all her <laughs> money. Yeah, and I liked like, okay, here's all these like professional poker players that are like the original like celebrity poker players. And then when it became, it was all just like 21 year old kids and hoodies and sunglasses that made money on the internet yeah. playing it was like they were all just interchangeable i was like okay this is boring you, know? you wanted personalities you wanted, wanted larger like, than you... life things you wanted like the hacksaw jim duggan of the <laughs> uh the, cele- the poker tour right no i want <laughs> your phil helmuths and antonio Sfandiari and those guys but anyways <laughs> yeah no hacksaw jim duggan <laughs> all right we got we got one more call from ed all right I don't even have the Twitter. Like, these would just be tweets. What I'm saying to you would just be tweets. Do you understand that? I don't even have Twitter right now. <laughs> Another thing. Uh, I have OhioCon coming up, and uh, I got my panel at it, and I'm working on that lately. And uh, like I said, I'm doing a cosplay from Wednesday at it. But here's the – I'm not going to tell you what I'm cosplaying, but I'll tell you what I'm not cosplaying. And it's thing, right? Even though – I came up with the best fucking idea for how to do a Sting cosplay where somebody just, uh, like, our friend just wears this, like, black bodysuit thing, like the full body ones, right? And you cut the hand off of it, and then the, that person is Sting, right? And this is, like, such a fucking good idea. And you know what? My friend's boyfriend said he won't do it. I, just, I think he's not fun anymore. And I'm very upset about it. It was such a good idea. And I can't do it. I already spent money on, like, another cosplayer. I just fucking do it. Because it's a great idea. It's a fantastic idea. I'm so fucking smart. <laughs> I hope Ed never hey, gets... Bye. Oh, I hope Ed never gets his Twitter back so we have more content for the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I was going to say, you know, it's amazing Pod Van Dam went away, you know? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh so that thing yeah, idea, thing? the thing costume is a great idea. I agree. Um, I don't know what character you're dressing up from as Wednesday because I haven't seen the show. I just hope you've learned the dance. Is all I, I is all I hope, Ed. Yeah, like I was assuming when he said like that he is going to be Wednesday. Like that mm-hmm. uh, that was a foregone either that or Wednesday's roommate who has like blonde hair with like pink and blue streaks in it and stuff like that. that like that's I, who. If, if, if that sounds like Ed to me. Yeah, that that's all. But but she's not goth. She's all like bubbly, and I could see Ed wanting to be like a goth girl. Mm, I could see Ed being bu- Ed's very bubbly. Ooh, Ed, like one of those half and half, like the duality of Dean type deals, where like half of you is the is Wednesday, and half of it is the the bubbly roommate whose name I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just right down the middle, like Two Face. Well, Ed never shares pictures of his cosplay online, so we'll never see, never know what it is. So this is true. You can say he was anything, and I'd believe him. Right? He was a he was just a cat girl again. Oh, don't you remember that scene in Wednesday where there was a cat girl? No. Okay, that's who I was. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you, Ed. So, hey, um, you know, before we do the plugs, I would be remiss not to mention uh, the new segment, Weekly Purges. Ah, oh, yes. So I Ed, have nothing you, to purge. Uh, I- have you yeah, pared down your it. collection any? It was Christmas. What do you want me to do? Like, I'm not selling stuff over Christmas. I'm a, I'm a busy boy with, like, commitments and places to go and things to do. All right. Well, <laughs> people need stuff to buy, and you need to make room for the new stuff that you're getting, you know? It is true. It is true. But no, I didn't sell anything. But I'm sure you have a lot of screenshots you need to purge. I do. Um, so I had, um, one where somebody tagged me wondering what Mantis's current Christmas setup looks like. 
And I did <laughs> screenshot that and send it to Mantis and of course got no sold. <laughs> um, per somebody else's request, since I have a first printing of the Wrestle Crap book, I had to take a screenshot of the uh, acknowledgments in the beginning to uh, verify someone's theory. All right. Less said about that, the better. Um, I there was I saw it pop up online, and I had to send it to Ed because I know he may not have seen it. It was a, very clearly a staged photo, but a, a funny photo nonetheless. Um, and it was uh, of CM Punk choking Tony Khan. All right. <laughs> um, another one was one of the many reasons I don't go on Facebook very often. Um, I either get. Uh, peop- un- under the people you may know suggestions of wrestlers under their shoot names or yep. bags of trash like Daniel Matheson so I had to take a picture and send that to someone else <laughs> I do get a lot of the shoot name of wrestlers especially like once one or two AIW guys fretted me now I see everybody you know and I have to text this to you because uh, I was just like me and my son were eating dinner on Wednesday and I just saw this pop up on my feed. He was looking over my shoulder, and he started cracking up. He's like, oh, my God, send that to me. So I had to take a screenshot of this and send it to uh, Asa so he could show it to his buddies. And I just sent it to you in a text. What the fuck is this? That's Reborn Steven, very clearly, right? Uh, sh- sure. <laughs> All right. What? Now I'm going to have nightmares. What the fuck? Right, so now I could get rid of all those things out of my uh, my phone. Those are the weekly purchases. Uh, I want to purge that from my 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 memory. Like I gotta, de- I'm literally deleting that picture out of the thread so that the next time I text you, I don't see it. <laughs> oh okay. My God. Oh, why? Move on. I gotta re- recalibrate here. <laughs> all right. So hey, uh, Jerry's to- Internet Wrestling Emporium. They're doing Restival this weekend. Um, there was already shows here on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. There's shows, uh, Pizza Party Pro did a show, ICW did a show, Wrestle Open, which is Beyond, but we just don't call it Beyond, and Beyond is doing a show. Go sign up for Jerry's Internet Wrestling Emporium, aka IWTV. Uh, they just recently put up some new All Japan women's stuff. Well, new to the service, it's older stuff. But anyway, uh, definitely check that out. Um, use the promo code at odds. Let Jerry know that you came to him from us. Um, with that promo code, we get a little bit of a kickback if you keep your subscription with them. Uh, there is no T public sale going on currently, but you could always help us out and support us by making any and all of your purchases through our Amazon affiliate link. Uh, it is in the show notes to every single one of these episodes. Uh, they, Amazon, call it an advertising fee. I call it the thing that makes Adam happy at the end of the month when he gets his cut of the fucking money. Yeah. Notable purchases through the Amazon click-through this past week include a four-pack Apple MFI certified iPhone fast chargers. Oh. I would never uh, own an iPhone, but that's interesting. Uh, a DeQuinn three-pack stretch solo loop band compatible with Apple Watch. Uh, I would never own an Apple Watch, but thank you for the purchase. Right. And then somebody purchased a Funko Pop TV, the Flash, Zoom action figure. And a Funko Pop's not really an action figure. Uh, but that <laughs> is, I'm not and I'm not a Funko Pop guy. I got all the Funko Pops I need. Uh, but that is a really cool one. Uh, yeah, you know, that, that, that Zoom, I assume, is like the all black one from like season two, right? A Flash? Correct. Yeah, no, that's a that's a cool looking figure or pop, but yeah, nobody's having a, a fig fed of Funko Pops. No, you know, <laughs> nobody's having them like taking them out of the boxes and playing with them unless you're Broski and they're still uh, Brian. Uh, Brian's youngest daughter does, but other than that, yeah, well, she's three. <laughs> right. But, uh, I don't okay. think she listens to podcasts. Um, yeah. She's not a listener from us. <laughs> no. Uh, so again, thank you everyone for uh, purchasing through our Amazon click-through link, whether it be this month, this week, this year, this whenever. It's all greatly appreciated. Yeah. And uh, Joe, you know what's also appreciated? These other podcasts. And uh, those podcasts are Longbox Heroes, Longbox Heroes After Dark, Final Wrestling Place, We Need Wrestling. Did I get that right? I did. Porch Talk, Viewer's Choice, WWE War, Wrestling Cheers, Indie Wrestling Guide, Wings on Wings, Between the Sheets, Hit My Music, If You Catch My Grift, and maybe in its last plug, maybe I'll throw another plug or two depending on what kind of supplemental content goes out, but 
Pod Van Dam, go listen to their last episode once again. Well, they said they're going to do the Dwight recap episode, and then Ed is doing one last thing, I think, the week after that to kind of close everything out. Um, Maybe a couple more weeks of plugs, we'll see. But I have a tight leash on my plugs. Looking at you, uh, DeWiki, but, uh, you know, sometimes you got to cut some of these people out for not producing content, so get on it. But, uh, hey, Adam, you mentioned Between the Sheets. I did. That's right. Uh, so I am making my triumphant return to Between the Sheets, not this Monday, but the following Monday. Uh, we are reviewing the week that was 1995 in the world of sports and entertainment. Now, a- as somebody who obviously listens to every episode of Between the Sheets and is very familiar with this, um, Monday is the drop or Monday is the recording? Well, we're recording it because, again, we're recording it this upcoming Monday and Wednesday. Okay. And then it's coming out the following Monday. So that would be the 9th. It comes out on the 9th. Gotcha. Again, like, I, I, I'm just, a, I, I listen to so much between the sheets that it all blurs together, like, with the release schedule and stuff like that. So sometimes uh, I go back and listen twice, you know? Yeah, uh, you've fallen behind. I, I have. I'm a couple of episodes behind. <laughs> but, but no, I'm, I'm very excited. Place. Um, you know, a lot of times they've contacted me and it was like a last minute sort of thing. It's like, oh, we had a guest drop out. Could you, could you like get on recording like 20 minutes? And I'm like, nope, I can't. Yeah. Uh, but this week, Chris reached out to me on Monday of this week to say like, hey, are you good for next week? And I'm like, absolutely. You're giving me plenty of time. So already my New Year's resolution of being on less podcasts is already out the window. Yeah. And I'm going to give you a very easy, like five question uh, like questionnaire to give to like to read out to Bix, uh, just basic questions about the things we've talked about over the last couple of weeks, and he needs to be able to answer them. Like, you know, like, uh, what is the tournament that they start? We started on the podcast this week or last week. I just want to see, uh, kind of like see where Bix is at on his listenership. Yeah, I think Bix is a few episodes behind. Oh, <laughs> he's also a few episodes behind. Fair enough. Yeah. All right, he'd fail a quiz. Yeah, uh, you know, in a couple of weeks, he'll be able to answer it, you know? Oh, fair enough. But, uh, yeah, I'll go check that out. I, I, we are both contractually obligated to listen to each other's appearances on other podcasts, as long as you don't ruin the, the results of game show podcasts. Not anymore, I won't. <laughs> yeah. Gee, after three or four times of doing that, you've learned your lesson. That's right. Yeah. Fool me five times. Shame on me. Exactly. All right, it's now time for Adam's favorite part of the show. Yay. Some might cost a little. Some might cost a lot. But I'm the $100 Vansky. And your figures will be bought. Ha 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 Joe, after a couple lean weeks, I feel like I'm back in form. <laughs> well, uh, since I only have one thing, let me get mine out of the way so you can get back into your form and tell your story about how you fought a lady at the Walmart this week. <laughs> okay. Um, so part of the uh, Joe uniform is that I wear short sleeve shirts all the time and then I wear long sleeve white shirts underneath them, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, less for comfort and more so so that my ass and stomach don't hang out when I stretch. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, it's it's for everyone else. It's not for it's not for me. Believe me, I've never been comfortable in my entire life. Uh, but usually, um, because they're white shirts, and I usually get like four or five, so I can alternate them and everything else like that. But you know, after a lot of wear, they usually get pretty dingy. So usually, once a year, I buy new ones, and it's usually right after Christmas. And I bought my new set of twosies, which is what we call them here in the house. Now, the old ones, do you throw them out or do they just kind of blow away like a dandelion at the end? They get they get tossed. They're like they're less white than they're more gray at this point. (laughs) Oh, all right. Yeah. You know, I think that's more of a long box thing. The uniform, you know, Mm -hmm. like I'm not a I, 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 I feel like I mix it up too much to have a uniform. I but. have more non-black shirts in my regular rotation than I have in my entire life this year. Yeah? Yeah. Like, up. If I have, like, 
40 regular t-shirts that I go through, I would say like eight of them are not black. Okay. Which is pretty you. high for me. Yeah, yeah. That That is something I've tried to make a conscious effort. Like, obviously, like, you buy a wrestling shirt or something like that. It's usually going to be black. But I'm like, I got to introduce. Let's not go crazy with, like, a lot of colors. But it's like, oh, you know, I don't mind the occasional red or blue or something like that. I got to mix it up a little. But Right. Well, cool. like, there was the Avery Good one this year that was, like, that powder blue. You know, looked like oh. the Mr. Perfect shirt. That's a great shirt. Uh, the latest gummy boar shirt, which was white with tons of colors on it. And that, that one really popped, you know? Yeah. I, I framed mine. I can't wear it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you should have the boar and Erica sign it, you know? Ooh, I wonder if that costs extra though. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I'm sure the boar will do anything to squeeze a couple extra bucks out of you. <laughs> it's possible. But, uh, yeah. So I, like I said, if you're doing wrestling shirts, you know, uh, uh mix it up a little, maybe not always black. But that's all you got? That's all I got. All right, buckle up, buddy. Uh, no, I don't have I, – I have a lot of stuff, but I'm not going to take a lot of time with them because I, I didn't have a big figure week. Uh, I had a big sports week, so I'll be very, very quick on this. Um, I, I try to buy at least one autographed rookie card of every, like, major stealer, like every, like, quarterback, wide receiver, running back, like, you know, position skill player guys. Um, and I, I've learned my lesson with not rushing and just kind of waiting in the weeds. And I picked up a 2019 Deontay Johnson, which is like a Steelers wide receiver, uh, an autograph rookie card of his limited to 199 copies. Uh, and I bought it on an auction that ended on Christmas day. So I don't think anybody else like no reasonable people are watching eBay to try to snipe stuff. And I paid $12 for it. And that's usually like a 50, $60 card. Ooh. So I, I was able to check that off the list. So see, this is why I was asking you about your weekly purchases. So that makes sense in that you wouldn't want to sell stuff during this time. Cause you know, stuff is going to not sell for as high as a price as it should. Yeah, because, I mean, most people, like, re- aren't shopping, you know, like, well, aren't, like, trying to buy stuff on Christmas Day or Christmas Eve or whatever, you know? So it's a bad time to sell. It's a good time to buy. For sure. Um, I started looking uh, on eBay for one specific stadium giveaway bobblehead, and I could not find that one specific one. Maybe we'll talk about it if I do track it down. But it caused me to go down a rabbit hole of a bunch of other stuff. So just really quick, I bought a 2021 Lakeshore Chinooks, which I guess is a minor league team. Oh, boy. Uh, Harrison Bader bobblehead. So uh, Harrison Bader, as everybody knows, my new favorite Yankee. I do not have a bobblehead of his. So I got that for like... after taxes. Uh, And I also found, this is something that I used to look for for a long time and I was never able to find one. And then I guess I might have deleted my save search out of frustration. But like there was a couple of them on eBay and they were all cheap. Uh, And I was like, oh my God, I should have bought this a long time ago. But it was a Forever Collectibles, which I guess is like a bobblehead company. Uh, a one of 456, which is a very odd numbering, uh, Cleveland Indians, Nick Swisher bobblehead. So this oh. is, it's not like a stadium giveaway, but I guess it's maybe like a team store type of thing. Um, and it's one like, again, I saw it years ago, was never able to find one. And there was two of them up on eBay. So I, I bought the one that was in the nicer box. Um, and then eBay suggested to me, Hey, you're looking at Nick Swisher stadium giveaway stuff. Did you know that in 2005 as a co-branded promotion between the Oakland A's and Chevrolet, they sold, or they gave away a Nick Swisher belt buckle. And I said, I didn't know that, but I need one. (laughs) So (laughs) I have a big, shiny Nick Swisher, Oakland A's Chevy belt buckle. (laughs) So um, Nick, Swish, Nick Swisher obviously got around, but he was very yeah. marketable enough that they would do all this stuff for him for all the different teams. Yeah, he, he started with Oakland A's, then went to the Chicago White Sox, then the New York Yankees. Uh, then he robbed Cleveland out of millions and millions of dollars and never delivered. Good. Uh, and then he got traded to the Atlanta Braves. Uh, then they released him and he played a little bit for our local rail riders before he retired. 
So I guess the question I have is, is there or are you in the midst of making the definitive Nick Swisher like memorabilia site book collection <laughs> database? Uh, no, because I'll tell you, there's there's a guy and I used to refer to him as my arch nemesis. There's a guy, uh, Chris Olds. He doesn't listen, obviously, but he was a writer for Beckett Price Guide and he's a huge Swisher super fan. And anything that I have, he has 20 of. So, like, I can't compete with that dude. And he's also, like, a professional, like, published, like, sports writer. So uh, that's his thing. And I'm also, like, not somebody that's like, oh, I need every single piece of memorabilia because it's impossible. Even somebody as obscure as him. Uh, So, like, I've just been focusing on things that were given away at stadiums as, like, oh, the first 5,000 fans or whatever. Uh, And up until that belt buckle discovery, I thought I had everything. You know, the Rail Riders bobblehead that we talked about a couple weeks ago, like, that was my last, like, holy grail. Uh, And then I saw this belt buckle, and it was, like, $6 shipped. So we're not talking a lot of money here. But uh, I think now I have everything. But, like, if another super cheap thing like that like i discover it then i'll grab it you know gotcha but uh that's it for sports stuff so you know uh, you won't have to be bored there i did buy one action figure type deal and this was actually something that i saw on paternia today i didn't even know that it was coming out and it kind of breaks one of my rules that i set months ago Uh, If you remember, I said that I wanted to become the Michael Jordan of Johnny Lawrence figure collecting. Yes. And then I realized that I would never be able to find or afford uh, like an early 80s Remco figure. So I was like, okay, we're just going to do Cobra Kai stuff. If you remember that, like that concession. I I do. But uh, they announced today, or at least they went up for pre-order on Amazon, uh, is a Diamond Select exclusive one of 4,000. Uh, it says Cobra Kai, but it, if you look at it, it's a Karate Kid box set based on the uh, like the Johnny Lawrence versus Daniel LaRusso all karate championship, like California State thing. Uh, and it's like a two-figure box set. And like I said, limited to 4,000 and it went up for pre-order and I'm like, it's cheap. And I'm like, you know, what? I'm going to get, I'd rather get it and not need it than not get it and then change my rules down the road. So, and it is in the same scale and the same figure line as all of the Cobra Kai figures I've been buying over the last year. So I think it, it looks good with them. Okay. You know, even though I said I wanted to try to avoid things based on the movie, just to kind of impose rules, but I got in on the ground floor with this, so I didn't pay much. Rules are made to be broken. This is true. This is true. Uh, and the only other thing I say, I don't want to like, you know, I got a lot of cool gifts from lots of different people. Uh, very grateful. But I did get from my mom uh, a bedroom TV. Uh, and I, it's something that I, even though I live alone, I have a giant ass TV in the living room. I was like, I'd like to have a TV to put in the bedroom so I could just put on Netflix and like listen to Seinfeld as I fall asleep and uh, the TV is awesome, but I discovered that I can't sleep with a television on, which is kind of backfiring to me, but uh, I'm trying to find something that I can play in the background that I enjoy, but that I don't sit up all night laughing to. So maybe a show I don't enjoy as much as Seinfeld might have to be the perfect thing, but uh, happy to have a bedroom TV and that's it for me, Joe. Oh, uh, you could put the uh, 1987 Slammies on a loop. <laughs> I don't want to have nightmares. Oh. But. I am a big podcast person when I go to sleep. Usually it's like I'm catching up on like the backlog of stuff. Yeah. Um, but more times than not, I'd be like, oh, I'm finishing up something as I go to bed. But my MP3 player is filled up with um, episodes of Knowledge Fight and episodes <laughs> of Between the Sheets. And uh, on the Dana Gould podcast, he does like a odd history uh he's rebranded them in the last several years as true tales from weirdsville and i go and i pull all of those things out of the podcast and i just have a folder of all of those so like i'll alternate between those that i listen to as i sleep see i i i get that but i i don't want to watch or listen to something that i might fall asleep and then like miss like 
I have it's, podcasts that I need to listen to, but like if I fall asleep halfway through, am I going to go back or am I just going to skip what I slept through? It, like, I don't like that idea. It's usually stuff that I've listened to before. Oh, see, I've never listened to a podcast more than once. I uh, listen. You and I live completely different lives, my friend. You know, there's other new podcasts every day. You don't have to listen to the same ones again. Um, the episodes of Pod Van Dam, where Dom tells the story about uh, the New York baloney Phil Baroni, and where our dear departed friend Matt and Pissed Off Taker um, <laughs> come on the show. I have those two as permanent on my podcast thing. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I know how long those are. And I'm like, uh, there's nothing doing. I'm not going to be able to get to whatever. Um, I only have 36 minutes. So I could listen to Madden Pissed Off Taker. Uh, I have 48 minutes. I could listen to the Dom talk about the Phil Baroni thing. Um, See, the only time I've ever listened to a podcast twice is if I'm trying to force somebody to listen to a podcast <laughs> on a road trip. Gotcha. I'll, like put on like... Like I've uh, the last time I went to Ohio with uh, my buddy Rob, I made him listen to the "If My Catch If You Catch My Grift" with Ed talking about Belle Delphine. So I've heard that twice. You know? Gotcha, like that type of thing. But I've never like voluntarily listened to one twice. I like I already G- heard it. I don't need to hear it again. Give it a try. This could be your thing. It might be. But you know, it's also my thing, Joe. Starting. What? Get in arguments and fights in public now, apparently. All right, let's get into it. Uh, it's not really a huge story, but it's just something that, like, I feel like this has been happening to me more and more lately. Maybe I'm just getting crotchety in my old age, but I like to think, now that I've retired from importing and exporting, and quite possibly from ever working again, uh, like, I feel like anytime I see somebody, like, be a dick to anybody in retail or in service, since I ate that shit for so many years and I know they can't do anything about it. Like, I feel like I need to be like the person who says something or does something like I'm like the punisher, but like, I only take out like dicks at retail. (laughs) Like, but no, the, if you know when you leave walmart and i didn't buy anything because the stores are a fucking wasteland and more of a wasteland than they normally are uh but i did my rounds uh at target and walmart and GameStop for a safari but i'm leaving walmart and you know how like people like with shopping carts will be you know politely stopped by the greeter and be like hey can i take a look at your receipt yeah so i'm walking out i'm behind like an older lady like maybe 60 or something like that she's got a giant shopping cart full of stuff the guy asked to see the receipt and then she says something to the effect of what is this communist russia and then she like she's all guffawed and she's like looking around like waiting for her applause you know like waiting for people to pat on her back like yeah you tell them yeah like just and I, I would just walk by and I heard that. I was like, shut the fuck up. And I just kept walking. Like, like she, and then she clutched her pearls. Like, oh, how dare somebody talk to me like that? But it's just like, the guy's just doing his fucking job. You don't have to make a big, oh, what is this, Nazi Germany? Like, I have to show my receipt. Guffaw. So I just got so, like, flash pissed that I just, like, told her to fuck off. But, uh, and then hopefully she got mad at me and not the employee and uh, as I left. But uh, like I said, anytime I see somebody just being a dick to a retail employee or a food service employee, like I'm not going to stand for it anymore. I'm going to just give it right back to them. Like, like Todd, uh, you know, spoiler for uh, after dark, but like Todd had an incident with uh, 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 witnessing somebody being mistreated in food service. And Todd's solution was to be super nice to the, the employee, which is great, but me, if I was there, I would have fucking retaliated against the person that was being mean. That's just me, but again, I've got a lot of pent-up frustration, and I'm taking it out on anybody that's a dick to, like, somebody in retail or servicing. So, um, I lean more toward you in situations like this. Yeah. But I run into situations like, I'll only do things like that if I'm alone, yeah, I mean, I, you can't do in front of Asa or whatever. Well, or, or April. <laughs> definitely, I can't do it in front of April. Okay. Yeah. Um. So I mentioned earlier about how that traffic pattern up by me, up by the arena there, for like every week during the holidays, coming home from the comic book shop was just like jam packed, right? Yeah. So I did mention it last week because I just thought nothing of it, but I'm gonna bring it up here because it's similar but not exactly to what you're doing. Okay. 
Yep. So you, you know where I'm talking about. You come down, you pass um, the Wegmans, you go around the loop to where like the Sam's Club is, and you're yeah. going to go down to that light where you can keep going straight, or you can go left to go to where the Sheets is, if you're familiar with my little area here, right? Yeah, I'm familiar. Like, I know the okay. general area. So because that go making the left there into Sam's Club gets so backed up, it kind of filters into the regular lane of making the left down at the bottom of the light, okay? Yep. So I happen to be there at the end of whatever it is to make the left to go to Sheets, okay? And I see a person who puts their blinker on and they're trying to get in. So I let them in, okay? Mm -hmm. But the person who I let in doesn't fully all the way go in and they're kind of like sticking with their ass end out just because the way the traffic pattern went, whatever, okay? Mm -hmm. So then I see another person who comes up and tries to snake their way into that, okay? Yep. I'm in the car with Asa, and I tell Asa to roll his window down. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, when I want to, I can have a very loud voice, right? Uh Uh-huh. And it was like, I don't want to say a teenager, but it was like definitely somebody who was in like their mid to late 20s, right? Mm. And I just start yelling, hey, hey, to get his attention. And he looks at me. And I give him the finger wave. I go, "Uh uh-uh. I go, I let them through. I ain't letting you through. You wait your turn. And Asa just looks at me like, what are you doing? I go, you need to let these people know. Kindness is easily to get walked over. I go, you let one person through, and that pays karma. You don't let everyone through. That was the lesson for the kid. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, no, I could see that. I, I, yeah, these people are like, oh, I'm gonna let every single oncoming car come through. You know, just yeah, no, fuck that. You let one car. But, um, but like Todd's situation, uh, if you listen to Long Box Heroes After Dark this week, if I had my food already in hand and like I was on my like I was like I had my stuff, I was ready to go, and then this woman did this, yeah, I would have said something to her. But if I if I said something to her and then I had to sit there and wait for my food, I wouldn't have done it. Does that make sense? No, I got gotcha. you. Uh, like, again, it, it depends on who it is and whatever, but I've said before and I, I, I'm not uh, like, I, I hope this doesn't come off as boastful, but I'm not afraid of any elderly person or, or like child or infirm. I'll fight. Right. Them. Like it doesn't matter. So like if I had to say it and then sit there it's like, I, I'll take it, you know, uh-huh. but <laughs> But yeah, go listen to the epic story of Fish Math uh, Friday for all the pores. Yes. Uh, so I think that's it for the show. A nice lean uh, under three hour event as usual. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, I tried to keep weekly purchases relatively quick. Right. I, mean, I just couldn't get I couldn't get you to stop talking about the slammies. What can I tell you? Don't worry. I'll never talk about it again. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, everybody, thank you very much for listening. Uh, This was episode 222 of At Odds with Wrestling. For Adam, this is Joe saying be safe out there and enjoy some wrestling. You're listening to the soon-to-be-named network, the Lamborghini of Podcast Networks.